Black Star Network is here. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Like, Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
Today is Wednesday, March 13th, 2024. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. The Georgia judge presiding over the election interference case of Donald Trump has dismissed six counts in the indictment, accusing Trump and his 18 co-defendants of trying to steal the 2020 election. Former DeKalb County, Georgia DA Robert James will explain why Judge Scott McAfee dropped those specific charges and whether they could be uh, refiling them. Black Women's Roundtable Essence and Hit Strategies released the ninth annual Power of the Sister Vote. Melanie Campbell will be joining us to talk about those results. Former Alabama head coach Nick Saban participated in a uh, Senate hearing on Capitol Hill complaining about the current state of college football, saying that so many of these kids now are focused on the money, says the guy making nearly $10 million a year. Joe Rogan, a clip is circulating where he said, I, I would vote for Trump because, you know, Biden is going to give us this diversity bullshit. Ooh, you know I got something to say about the frankly unintelligent Joe Rogan. And the music forever is going to be dropping by our studios with their new album drops on Friday. We're going to have an exclusive listening session right here at the Black Star Network. It is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered. On the Black Star Network, let's go. He's got whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Folks, uh, in Fulton County today, Judge Scott McAfee uh, dismissed six charges from the indictments against Donald Trump and 14 co-defendants charged with a racking tier conspiracy if they tried to steal the 2020 election. In his order, uh, McAfee wrote his reason for dropping the charges was they were not specific enough against the former president, against Donald Trump and a handful of his co-defendants. Uh, the six charges are uh, court count two alleges that the multiple defendants uh, solicited elected, elected members of the Georgia Senate uh, to violate their oaths of office on December 3rd, 2020 by requesting or uh, 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 importing them uh, to unlawfully uh, support presidential elections. Count five, defendant solicited the Speaker of the Georgia House of Representatives to violate his oath of office on December 7, 2020. Count six, defendants Smith and Giuliani uh, solicited members of the Georgia House of Representatives to violate their oaths of office on December 10, 2020. Count 23, multiple defendants solicited elected members of the Georgia Senate to violate their oaths of office on December 30, 2020. Count 28, defendants Trump uh, and Mark Meadows solicited the Georgia Secretary of State to violate his oath of office on January 2, 2021. Count 38, defendant Trump solicited the Georgia Secretary of State to violate his oath of office on September 17, 2020. 21. There was no comment from uh, Fulton County uh, DA uh, Fonnie Willis with regards to this decision. Joining me now is Robert James, the attorney, also the former DA in DeKalb County. Glad to have you here, Robert. So, Robert James, explain to us exactly what happened here. Is this uh, a death knell to the case, or is, is this really something perfunctory that can actually uh, be fixed, if you will, by Fulton County DA? Well, it's no big deal at all, and it can be fixed by uh, the Fulton County DA's office. Um, it essentially is the judge saying there's not enough specificity in the, um, in the indictment to put the defendants on notice as to how they violated the law, or more particularly, what part of the law they violated or what part of their oaths they violated. And so you have to put that in there so they can prepare their defense. So... Uh, what does this mean then for the Fulton County DA office? Could they 
do, do they have to go back to a grand jury, re-indict them on these charges, or could they say, you know what, we're not going to worry about this here, we're going to move forward uh, on uh, what we are, what already done, uh, what we already have? Well, they could do either one. They could go back to the grand jury, and, you know, D.A. Fonnie Willis could have a fresh indictment by, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday of next week, depending on when the grand jury meets. And so that's very possible because you only have six counts, and so it's not as if it's going to take, you know, two or three days or a month to get this indictment. You know, the other portion of it is that they could say, you know what, we have another 34, 35 counts of this indictment. Other individual, these same individuals are charged with other crimes. And so we're just going to ride with what we have. And so we don't need these counts. So she has options. So I, I've seen a lot of people today say, oh my God, this could delay this thing any further. Based on what you just said, not really. No, no, there, there's no reason why it would delay it. It doesn't take much time to get an indictment on six counts. Look, when I was DA, you know, we would have grand jury twice a week. Our jurisdiction was even small, was smaller than Fulton's, and you could come out with 20 or 30 indictments, you know, a day. And so, you know, even though this is special and it's different and it's bigger, but there's no reason why they couldn't meet next week or the week after and, you know, have a re-indictment sometime soon there. <coughs> so. I, I saw um, one of the analysts on one of the other networks say, oh, uh, D.A. Fonnie Willis and her team, they were sloppy in doing this. You agree? Or this simply one of those things where uh, a, a judge makes a decision and, and, uh, and then, you know, you make adjustments? Well, I wouldn't call it sloppy. It was just, I think it was an oversight. Um, you know, they, they alleged specifically that um, these individuals were solicited to violate their oaths of office. And, you know, the law requires you put what portion of their oath of office that they would be violating, because otherwise, you know, the defendants can't, you know, can't prepare to defend and say, well, no, he wouldn't have violated his oath of office by doing this. And so, so I wouldn't call it sloppy. It was just an oversight, and the law allows for you to fix it. All right, then. Robert James, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Thank you for having me. All right, then. Uh, folks, uh, my panel today, Scott Bolden, he is, uh, of course, uh, new, a, a political contributor for News Nation, former chair, National Bar Association, PAC, uh, Talek McMillan, uh, social justice leader, movement strategist out of Washington, D.C., also Robert Patillo, host, People, Passion, Politics, News and Talk, 1380, uh, WAOK out of Atlanta, because Robert is filing for office against this judge. He won't be commenting on this particular story. Let me go to Scott Bolden. Scott, just Scott, just your assessment of what happened today. Yeah, I would go even further uh, than your last guest. You know, as a former prosecutor, you review these indictments and the language of the indictments to get it right. And so the judge, Fannie Willis's office's interpretation of what was legally sufficient before she handed down the indictment and what the judge indicated in its ruling, they just have a difference of opinion. The solicitation, they know what the oath of office is, and the judge felt that they ought to reference the oath of office or put that specific language in there, although the law doesn't require it. But more importantly, the underlying factual predicate she didn't put in there, and she didn't necessarily think she had to, because remember, the whole indictment talks about the factual predicate for each of these allegations. And so this is this is a this is a legal disagreement. They can re-indict these individuals. Can they get the original jurors back? Uh, that might be a challenge. Or she doesn't have to indict them all, because remember, there are several counts, at least 10 counts still pending against Giuliani, Giuliani several counts still pending against Trump. And this is a wide range um, conspiracy speaking indictment. So this is a bunch of this is a bunch of hooey about nothing, really. Um, Scott, does this give us an indication, if you will, maybe, maybe not? Uh, of how the judge may rule as to whether or not uh, uh, D.A. Willis uh, can stay on this case? You know, I've been going back and forth with my colleagues about that and other commentators. Um, I think if he was going to throw her off the case, he would delay this decision. Because why make this decision uh, that can be easily remedied uh, if if he's going to throw her off the case, he would wait and then deal with the new DA. And so I think it means he's going to keep her on the case. 
that opinion she's not going to like his opinion if she keeps him, if he keeps her on the case because he's going to be very critical of how this all happened but in the end i don't think the defendants have proven uh, by preponderance of the evidence that there was a financial incentive or that any um, ethical rules were broken or whether, you know, there's a conflict of interest created by this relationship. I just don't think it's there. There's some cred credibility issues, but those were never resolved. And if they're not resolved, they're going to be resolved in favor <coughs> of keeping her. All right, folks, let's go to our next story. With the presidential election uh, eight months away, the Black Women's Roundtable Essence and Hit Strategies released uh, the ninth annual Power of the Sister Vote the poll is a survey of black women voters on the issues that matter most to them. Melanie Campbell uh, with the Black Women's Roundtable joins us right now with the poll results. Melanie, get, glad to have you here. So, you. Um, what does it show? Uh, it shows that for the first time that I've in, uh, ever known, that black women are in what you call the persuadable category, that we are going to have to be persuaded um, um, to vote. There's also generational divide, that the younger you are, uh, the less likely that you say you, that you're going to vote, right? Uh, we know there's anxiety. Anxiety is high. All the things that you know that we know around issues, but when it comes to where we stand politically, that there, there is a lot of work that has to be done. So when you say in the persuadable category, uh, what's the difference from previous polls? Were previous polls that these black women were ardent uh, supporters voting for a Democratic candidate? And so, Most definitely. so right. and, and so the poll now is saying what? The poll still is um, uh, saying that uh, they would still vote majority Democrat, but right now, not as high. The other is just even saying you're going to vote at all. The numbers are, 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 are reflecting that there's work to be done, right? Um, what was positive, I think, uh, but not even where it used to be. Rolling black women tend to vote. We're not a monolith, but we are strategic. Uh, and we look at it. And we tend to be, our numbers tend to be much higher. Uh, um, I can't remember now, and, and Dr. Ava Jones was a weaver, and of course, you know, Terrence uh, uh, Woodbury and, and Hit Strategies uh, was our po poster. Uh, but we also had, you know, Dr. Ava Jones and Weaver who helped with the analysis. And none of us have seen that before. So there is a difference. There's a lot to, to un, un, unravel. Uh, but the bottom line is the Democratic Party, if they want the black vote to turn out for them, they're going to work for it. And if the Republicans want to take a stab at moving it, they, gotta, they have work to do. And black women are not a sure thing. They're going to have to work for it. Let's, just like they have to work for black men and all of us, they got to work for the black vote. Bottom line. So when you say there's a clear gener when you say there's a clear generational divide, give us um, what that what that looks like. And what what age age range are we talking um, about? Generation <clears throat> Z, right? Those are the youngest in their twenties. Uh, those who are eighteen to twenty, I think eight, Gen Z is eighteen to twenty six. So I maybe have that off a little. But that there's a major divide between that and what you call the uh, the, the more senior. Uh, 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 generation, right, boomers. Uh, and so when you're looking at the data, which I'm sorry, I don't have it all in, uh, to be able to go through it tonight, I really want to uh, make sure that we can have uh, rolling a deeper conversation about what this really means uh, when it comes to what has to happen. You've been out here uh, uh, hanging from the rooftop saying you got to work for it. This poll is another example that the folks going to have to work for our vote. And black women are not a sure thing. We are the secret sauce. You hear me say that, right? Well, the secret sauce has a lot to do with not just turning out. It has to do with us also working hard to get our families, our husbands, our significant husbands, our nieces, our nephews, our community. That's that secret sauce. And the enthusiasm level is too low. So uh, economics uh, is a huge issue. Uh, economic anxieties, inflation. Inflation, but, yes. But Cost also, but, but also uh, reducing gun violence. Right, right, exactly. So you know what's different, Roland? When you think of this is our ninth year, right? For the, the entire time under uh, Obama, they were more aspirational uh, about the things uh, like uh, making sure you had a uh, 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 liver wage, uh, things about college affordability. Then when Donald Trump was in office, then it was racism was number one for the entire 
time he was in office. Now we racism is still high because we're going through it. But now it's now it's bread and butter day to day things about just being able to survive. Economic issues are a major concern uh, in this in this poll uh, bears it out. Um, and so um, what, what really I think is speaking loud and clear here uh, is that if you are Biden Harris, if you if you are examining uh, if you are examining uh, this issue here, uh, really what jumps out is uh, you got a problem. Yeah, and and that, and look, you know, polls are a snapshot in time, and in the month of Black History Month, uh, we uh, Houston we have a problem, right? Um, so. Folks need to pay attention. I know, you know, there's a lot of, of data out there, and this is one of those things that it has bear, born, uh, tested uh, the test of time. Has we with this poll, this is our ninth year, and I tell you, the shift is is very, um, very concerning. Um, what's uh, there's one thing that jumps out uh, to you. What's that one thing uh, with, with this particular poll? The one thing for me was that we normally say we're going to vote Democrat 90, you know, 85, 90, 90 percent. That's not what we're seeing right now. What, what, so, what, what's the number? Uh, I what's think the, the number uh, was 56 percent or something. I'm not looking at it. 56. Uh, 50, um, sure that they were going to vote. Sure they were going to vote. So part of it, it has to do with the enthusiasm to show up. Right. Is, is, is one of those things that is really important to pay attention to. All right, then, Melanie Campbell of the Buckingham's okay. Roundtable. We appreciate it. Where can people go to get to actually see um, the full poll? Yeah, unitycampaign.org. Unitycampaign.org. So I, or I'm, I'm, on, I'm on unitycampaign.org. Where is it on? Yeah, it, um, it should be a link right at the top. Uh, link. Got it. Okay, it's a PDF yep. here. Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay. It, yeah, it has all the data. Okay. All right, we appreciate it. Uh, Thank you. Thanks appreciate a lot. you so much for sharing. Okay. Thanks so much. Folks, going to a break. We're going to come back, discuss this with uh, my panel uh, next. Roland Martin on the Filters on the Black Star Network. For the last 15 or maybe 16 years, 18 years, I'll say, since I, when I moved to L.A., I hadn't had a break. I hadn't had a vacation. Probably a week vacation here or there. Right. This year, after I got finished doing Queen Sugar and we wrapped it up, because I knew I had two TV shows coming on at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take a little break. So I've been on break for the first time, and I can afford it. Praise right. God. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. So I can afford it. I'm like, I can right. sit back and ain't got nothing to worry about, man. But this was the first time in almost in, in two decades wow. that I've actually had time to sit back wow. and, and, and smell the roses. <laughs> Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Democracy in the United States is under siege. On this list of bad actors, it's easy to point out the Donald Trumps, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, or even the United States Supreme Court as the primary villains. But as David Pepper, author, scholar, and former politician himself says, there's another factor that trumps them all and resides much closer to many of our homes. His book, is Laboratories of Autocracy, a wake-up call from behind the lines. So these state houses get hijacked by the far right, then they gerrymander, they suppress the opposition, and that allows them to legislate in a way that doesn't reflect the people of that state. David Pepper joins us on the next Black Table here on the Black Star Network. This is Essence Atkins. This is the Love King of R&B, Raheem Devon. It's me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you're watching. You're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. All right, folks, uh, welcome back to Roland Martin, Unfiltered, right here on uh, the Black Star uh, Network. Uh, I have the, um, uh, the poll up uh, right here, uh, Anthony. Go to my iPad um, in a second. Give me. We should be. Give me a second. We should be pulling it up. Uh, and so uh, you see right here uh, where it hit strategies. Terrence Woodbury explains methodology. Uh, methodology. Uh, they talked to uh, 800 Black women, registered voters nationwide, 
Uh, they were in the field February 16th through 2000, February 16th through the 21st. Uh, and, um, and then and you see right here, it also says the presentation also includes comparative data from a 2022 phone interview poll conducted by Brilliant Corners among 601 black women. So a poll was done uh, in 2022 by Cornell Belcher's firm, Brilliant Strategies. This poll was done by Terrence Woodbury uh, with Hit Strategies. Uh, and uh, you see right here, uh, number one, economic anxiety, clear generational gap. Number three, a slim majority of black women voters support President Biden's re-election. 20% remain undecided about who to support. Uh, it says here, a uh, fourth part of this generational gap comes from younger black women, voters feeling increasingly anxious about the upcoming elections, and they don't see that their lives have gotten better in the last four years. Biden has a clear lead in the 2024 presidential election, but his greatest threats are potentially independent third-party voters and drop-off voters, especially among young black women. Let's go back uh, to uh, my panel. Uh, to have them uh, uh, talk about this here, uh, and uh, if you look at uh, this, uh, if you look at this panel, if, excuse me, I'm sorry. If you look at uh, if you look at this um, uh, poll, you look at the Black Voter Pat poll, you look at the Higher Learning poll. Um, what you have are, is clear data. Unlike all of these other polls that we have seen that are speaking to. African Americans are speaking to uh, African Americans. These other polls, there's been a sliver of people in those polls. We're now talking about African Americans. Uh, Tyler, I want to go to you first. You, you were you were shaking your head when Melanie was talking, um, and uh, if you're Biden Harris, um, this should be fire alarms going off, red flags going off. This says they have got a problem. If you don't have black women going hard for you, you got a real issue. Yeah, exactly, Roland. Thank, thank you for, for having me on. I think, you know, as we look at the last presidential election, we know that it was black women who, who stood up and, and got Biden Harris over the finish line. And I think as we continue to see on it in this system, we understand that, it's, you know, that it, it will be black people who will, who will be the deciding factors uh, in this election. And I think. I think it's no surprise to the administration uh, about what the work that needs to be done that Melanie spoke about for black voters. But I think as, as, she, as she pointed out amongst younger voters and undecided voters, those are the folks that we have to talk to, whether it's talking about some of their, uh, their political wins or talking about some of the things that the administration plans to do uh, if, if being reelected. But I think as we think about the, what's happening in the un, undecided vote, we see what is happening in the Middle East is really hurting this administration in their response. And, and we know we've seen a response from them uh, before where the vice president called out, a, called out a ceasefire at Selma or even during the presidential uh, State of the Union. But I think a lot of voters are thinking, you know, well, this is a little too late uh, in, 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 in the term of, 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 of their announcement on this. And so I think what's happening uh, in, you know, not only within the black community, and, and, and restoring, you know, economics. Uh, but as we look about what's happening around the world, young voters, uh, people of color are really looking at what's happening uh, and the United States' response to a lot of this stuff and really holding the administration accountable uh, for their support and what we see what's happening. Uh, Robert Patillo, uh, we have been talking about these issues from day one. I actually said in 2021, that the Biden-Harris campaign needed to focus on their re-election the day after the inauguration. In 22, I said, don't you wait. You got to start early. In 2023, January, I was like, I'm telling y'all, the campaign needs to be starting now, educating, enlightening people. January 2024 said the same thing. We've been ringing the alarm this poll had better wake their asses up. Well, they're not awake by now. I'm not quite sure what's going to wake them up. 
<laughs> You've been saying it. Scott's been saying it. I've been saying it. Yeah. Pretty much every black person in, in media has been saying this for the last four years at this point in time, which is the black vote is no longer in a position to be taken for a, uh, for granted anymore. Uh, we pass that now. As, as they say on social media, it's above me. And there's no number of talking heads. There's no number of uh, community events, no number of football games you can go to uh, that are going to change that perception unless you change the policies around it or the way that you articulate those policies to the American people. It's not that the Biden the Harris administration hasn't done anything, it's that they've done a terrible job of articulating that to voters and making sure they understand exactly what they're feeling. When President Trump was going to send out stimulus checks, he made sure that the Trump signature was on every stimulus check, so people gave him credit for the stimulus checks. And it worked. Uh, when Trump did anything, he had a press conference in the Rose Garden. He had all the cameras there. He got credit for everything he did. This administration, as Pla said, doesn't know how to brag on themselves. And then also, they are, uh, they are definitely a victim of their own success, because if you're looking at the legislative victories that this, uh, this administration has had, and there's infrastructure, which they said it couldn't get, get done. Uh, the uh, Build Back Better bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, if you're talking about the CHIP bill, you get all these things done, and then you go to black voters and say, well, we didn't get voting rights quite done. We didn't get criminal justice reform quite done. We didn't get much of many of the things we promised you done, even though we got all that other stuff done. It starts to ring hollow. So I'm hoping that they are able to go to trusted voices in the community, have the type of talking points that are necessary. Don't try to talk to us through entertainers and rappers and those sorts of things, but really get surrogates out they're into the community and talking about what has been done and how we will be priority number one once they retake the House uh, and the Senate in the, uh, in the next term. I think that's what it will take to turn these numbers around. But you can't run the same dog and pony show and expect, this, expect different results. Uh, Scott, what this tells me is you can do an ad blitz, 30, 60 second ads. That ain't going to do it. Um, uh, I have said for months that what, what the Biden-Harris campaign should be doing from January to August, is engaged in a massive voter education, enlightenment uh, uh, campaign, literally where you're flooding the zone, where you are having town halls, conversations, dialogues with groups and organizations in Georgia, in North Carolina, in Florida, uh, in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin, specifically Milwaukee, in Michigan, in pockets of Nevada, Arizona. Those are the battleground states. But you also have to do this, uh, you also have to do this even more so because this is going to have a dramatic impact down ballot. If you're Senator Chuck Schumer, you're trying to get Congressman Colin Allred to beat Senator Ted Cruz. So you're going to need to be engaged in Houston, in Dallas, in San Antonio, in East Texas. Uh, if you're trying to get Sherrod Brown reelected in Ohio, you got to be doing this in Cincinnati, in Columbus, in Dayton, in Cleveland, uh, in Akron, in those places there. Uh, and so this is where J Jamie Harrison uh, and uh, Biden, Harris, uh, Jen O'Malley, Anita Dunn, they had better be looking at this poll and, and, and saying, right now, they should all be saying, oh, shit. Yeah, but, Roman, you, you presume that they will have an oh, shit moment. The reality is they have never fully invested in, invested in their black and brown base, right? And, and the other part of the country is getting amnesia on Donald Trump, where well, black people are getting amnesia on Biden-Harris. And it may be too late. I hope not. And tell you something else. I told you, you said a lot, but I told you two years ago, when they couldn't break that filibuster on voting rights, when they couldn't get that Criminal Justice Act redone, and we were we were meeting with, uh, you all were meeting, and civil rights were meeting with Republican senators and looking in their eyes, and they said, we're going to get this done on George Floyd. They didn't get a damn thing done. And I said then, right on this show, I said, black folks are getting tired of being tired, and they're going to remember it, because the black and brown base of the Democratic Party cannot win without black and brown votes. Now, they've always taken us for granted. And I also told you, and I also told you then that if you are the Biden-Harris administration and you have a civil rights division of the DOJ who is also yeah. putting in the work, yeah. you kind of yeah. need to tell you, know, you need to tell people. Part and look, I literally said this to the White House last week. 
I'm like, and I've said this on this show repeatedly, I said, how in the hell do you have the most aggressive civil rights division of the Department of Justice since Robert Kennedy was there? And I'm like, and y'all don't say nothing. I said, don't they... Don't know. And don't so, know. Right, so, so the deal is, even though you didn't, even though the George Floyd Justice Act wasn't passed, and let's be clear, that would only impact on the federal level, when you start talking about uh, patterns and practices investigations, putting uh, cops in jail, hate crimes, putting wardens, jailers in jail, redlining, uh, discrimination. Uh, I mean, we go on and on and on. They've been doing the work. The administration, I, ain't, I have never heard Corrine Jean-Pierre talk about it at the podium. And so what Biden has done, well, you know, but the, this is what their mentality has been. You know, we have to create this independence with the Department of Justice. No. The independence, Robert, with the Department of Justice is not dictating what they do. That doesn't mean you don't talk about what they have done. Exactly. It's the well, dumbest strategy. You should well, Roland, I, I find it amazing that Democrats won't talk about the good things they have done, and Donald Trump can just make up uh, things that he never did and just <laughs> claim that he did it. He'll just pull stuff out of midair, no matter who did, who did it or how. Uh, uh, look, at the at the end of the day, you if you talk to black rate, talk radio hosts, for example, around the country, how many of them do you know who have uh, interviewed uh, President Biden or who have interviewed uh, Vice President Harris or who have had any administration official or campaign official or surrogate come on their shows? We're expected to be sharecroppers, where they don't provide us with things, don't provide us with access, don't provide us with, uh, with guests or talking points or anything along those lines, but we're just going to comb out there and just get out there and do the work for them. Meanwhile, they're paying these consultant firms literally hundreds of millions of dollars to, quote, unquote, get out to vote for them, but we're supposed to do it for free. I think they need to understand that these that the their hold on the black vote is tenuous. It is not tenuous with regards to going to the Republican Party. It's tenuous with regards to just staying home altogether. If you talk to Gen Z voters in particular, if you talk to younger millennial voters, they're very much on the they're both the same. Why am I even bothering and staying home? And if they don't understand that yet, they will find out when they're on the wrong side of the election day, just like they found out in 2016. Yeah. I, 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 Go go ahead. No, I, I, I will echo those same words. I think we find our moments, we find ourselves in a moment of uh, what side of history that we stand on. And I think uh, in the, the determining that is still being able to go out and still vote. So I, that's why I'm still going around the country encouraging young voters to still get out and vote because it plays a part in how we shape our future. But, 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 but one, one, one second, one second. So when you're doing that, what are you saying to them? I want to know what, what are you saying to them? Because saying vote to me, doesn't do it. Are you explaining to them what has actually been passed and implemented? Yeah, of course. I think highlighting highlighting some of that work that we have seen from the Biden Harris administration, whether it was was what with the infrastructure bill, or whether it was with the executive order that happened, you know, uh, that that some of us been to the White House and, and on Capitol Hill, you know, advocating for. Whether it was, you know, highlighting some of the student debt cancellation that the president did do, although we are still calling for him to cancel all student debt, uh, but still highlighting some of those small victories, uh, I think is a part in playing that role. But also, but, but, but hold on one second, hold on one second, hold on second. When so, here's my question. So when you're highlighting that, first of all, for the audience's purposes, how old are you? I'm 27 years old. Say it again. 27. Okay, you're 47. When you're having these conversations. <laughs> are folks are folks telling you, man, I don't know what they've done? And then when you say this, 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 what are they? What's their response? Is it, damn, I didn't know that. Yeah, exactly. I'm I sorry, 27, 27. I didn't hear you. So 27. So when you say that, do they then go, damn, I didn't know they did all that? Yeah, I, I think it's just in in the knowledge of knowing actually what's happening. A lot of folks, even I, I talk to don't even understand the political process of how, of how Washington even works. And so being able to just go down back to the basics and, and, and educate our folks on the process and, and what control the executive board and what control the president actually has is important in, in, in getting that word out. But also it's important for uh, the administration to understand to meet people where they are, just that having those conversations in communities, understanding the, the prevalence and the importance of the black church, understanding the importance of historically black colleges and universities, and understanding what actually being in community means to draw the vote. Uh, but also that political education is so, so important uh, because uh, to be honest with you, Roland, it, it, it really is lacking 
in our political education, folks really knowing how our government actually operates. And see, that's the point right there. That's the point right there, uh, Robert, that uh, we have talked about on this show. Uh, in that people, and I see it all the time on social media, folk say, man, stuff needs to get done. Well, this is what's being done. Then it's like, oh, I ain't know that. I mean, it's sort of like people come, Roland, you should be discussing this. We did two days ago. Oh, <laughs> I ain't see the show. So <laughs> how your ass know what I'm talking about? And so what, I'm, what I keep saying uh, here and other places, what the administration has to do, you can't talk about things from 30,000 feet. And what I mean by that is you can't say we've had a historic investment in HBCUs. What's the number? And then when you say the number, what's the number below that? Meaning Florida A&M got this, A&T got this, Texas Southern got this, Alabama A&M got this. Uh, see, you, you, when you talk about the infrastructure deal, okay, what does that mean? The drinking water in this city, we're putting in all pipe, all new pipes, new wastewater system, fixing that bridge. If you are, not, in, in fact, if I'm, if I'm this White House, I'm taking the seven battleground states and I'm looking at, and I am putting together a fact sheet, and by the way, I asked for this on February 22nd, I'm still waiting. Uh, I'm putting together a fact sheet, these projects in Pennsylvania, these projects in Georgia, these projects in Milwaukee and Wisconsin, these projects in Michigan. The late Joe Madison made it clear, you got to put it where the goats can get it. Well, look, bro, in addition to that, what, let's take another example of what you can learn from President Trump, because I, I think you can learn things from anywhere. Uh, if this was President Trump's administration, every single one of those HBCUs that built something with that funding, he will be there for a ribbon cutting. Not only would he be there for a ribbon cutting if the blank, blank, blank center uh, presented with these federal dollars, he'd have a big banner up there saying that this, this was paid for by Trump. Then he would go on local radio there and local news. He would meet with uh, every major pastor and every religious leader in the community. Then he'd have a rally where he would bring in 20 or 30,000 people. And he would endorse all the way down to dog catcher, city council person, county commission, et cetera. Because that's what Donald Trump did when he went up to uh, up to uh, Dalton, Georgia, with Marjorie Taylor Greene. And he would uh, make sure he builds the coattails among the local elected officials in the local community so that they're campaigning for him long after he's been gone. And you set up almost a colony there of people who think like, you know, this is how Donald Trump took over the Republican Party, by making every single individual, no matter how small they were, believe that he personally cared about them and he was personally working for them. But when you have an administration, they want to send out a press release. The only people reading the press release are people in the press. Uh, you can't do it. You can phone these things in. You have to get out there and uh, do that shoe leather work and actually be, if you're opening up an infrastructure project, a new bridge that's been fit, uh, fit with uh, federal money that you put out there, you need to be in as many of those in as many swing states as possible of every elected official uh, that you can find, every community organizer you can find in order to build those things up. They're not putting in the shoe leather work and then they're expecting the results to then be phoned in for them. And, 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 and Scott, we've all talked about uh, the lack of investment over the years. What I am articulating now is not just, hey, you got to invest more. No. What I'm saying now is you have to understand that the black voter in 2024 is completely different from the black voter in 2008 when Obama ran. I'm not, I'm not even going back to, to, to 1960s. I'm saying the black voter in 2008 his math is math. That is, if a person was 16 when Obama was elected and they could not vote, that person today is 32. Mm -hmm. That person who is 20, when they, then that person is now 36. That person who is uh, 25, they're now in their 40s. And so the old model of reaching black voters is gone. You cannot depend on an NAACP get out the vote effort because even that's gone. 
You cannot depend on a black church model. You now have to actually, I dare say, spend three to four times more money because you now have to micro-target black people. You have to micro-target black business owners, potential black business owners, African Americans who are making uh, $100,000 or more, African Americans who are making anywhere from $5,200,000. It's, it's, it's a totally different black demographic, and I don't think these white consultants are listening to the black people inside to understand, hey, it's a different world out there. But, but Roland, you, you keep presuming that <laughs> Democrats in the leadership, the president, thinks like that. No, no, no. I didn't presume. I just laid out to you what needs to happen. I'm actually saying they don't think like that. What I'm exactly. So I'm not presuming. No, I'm presuming they don't know. And I'm also right. presuming that they are continuing to use the old model. What I'm saying is... The old model doesn't exist anymore, so you better listen to black people right now who are trying to tell you what the new paradigm looks like. Exactly. But here's some manifest evidence that they don't get it. When the infrastructure bill was passed, did you see Biden or Harris in, the, in any black community anywhere in this country announcing it? That helped black people. When the Anti-Inflationary Act, did you see them go to any African-American community or brown community? When, um, when they passed, uh, what else did they pass? Well, well, no, when no, they, no, they did, they did, but the problem is, mm -hmm. but here's the deal, here's what they did. They did, but the problem is it was too few and what did they do? They were hoping mainstream media shows up. They didn't show up. So if you oh, did please. not, if you did not have an aggressive, an aggressive, targeted, non-traditional media campaign, meaning black-owned, Latino, Asian American, women target, and targeting young, you failed because no one knew you. It was like a tree falling in the forest. When they passed the, to re, the, the legislation that reduced the cost of insulin, it, lots of black people got diabetes, right? Were they in the black community announcing that? No. Well, no what, well, again, though, again, again, they announced it, but again, yeah. what, they did not, what they did not have was a targeted campaign, and that's what I'm saying. So, so the question you're asking are just simply saying... you don't do that, if you don't do that, you tell me, like in any relationship we have, friendships, family, personal, if you, when you don't do that to me, you tell me you don't care about me. I don't have to have a PhD to know when somebody cares or, about or, me. Or, or it's not even, or it's not, his, not but here's the deal though. It ain't even, they didn't do it to black people. They didn't even talk to white people. But, <laughs> so I, I talked to a, a senior official in the administration and this is, this is what was stated to me. We passed a lot of major bills in a short period of time, and we were so focused on passing the bills that we didn't pay attention to how to sell the bills. Oh, this, this no, no, and here's the deal. No, no, no. And, and Tyler, here's the deal. That's exactly what Obama did. Obama later admitted the mistake that they made was they assumed people were going to know. What they, what, but what the Biden-Harris folks also misunderstood, which Obama didn't have to deal with to, to the same degree, you now have a much more massive, conservative media ecosystem that has been tearing apart everything that they've done. That's also driven the negatives up. Your thoughts? Yeah. McMillan? Tyler? Oh, oh, yeah. I, I think you know, we, we find ourselves in such a digital age where we, we, we're looking at the TikToks and the Instagrams and the, the Facebooks and, you know, all these content creators uh, where folks aren't really watching traditional news nowadays. And so there, there's so much pressure on really telling the story. Um, but I think, as you said before, not only it's happening to those communities, but it's happening to those, those listening, those trusted voices where, where folks are listening to is also important um, in strategy. Um, but as you said, the administration is totally missing the mark on really promoting themselves and really sharing the work that they're doing and really saying how it directly impacts communities. Um, but, it, but again, I, I will always echo again uh, what some of, my past, my, some of my panelists mentioned today was, you know, when we don't see voting rights advancement, act, John Lewis voting rights advancement act being passed, we, when we don't see 
the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act being furthered and passed. Black folks are looking for legislation that, that, that they know get, that resonates with them. And so uh, we have to do a better job of, of, of saying how the, this legislation that passed resonates with them and uh, really break down the numbers that show the impact that it's going to make in communities. Well, uh, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, they might want to wake up because here's the deal. We're now in middle of March. Late. We're now in the middle of March. This, no, first of all, it's not too late. Uh, it's okay. not. No, it's not. Watch. No, it's actually, it's Watch. not too late. You've got yeah. April, May, June, July, August, September, October. You've got seven months. If three you keep... years, man. Three years. Your faith in this administration... No, no, no. Oh, no. For three no, years. No. no. Uh, and you're, not, you're my, not just political campaign. You can't go. Can't hear you. What? Mike is on. Can you hear me? Can hear you now. Yeah. All right. Now you well, can. the damn mic is on. Here's the whole deal. If but you, you ain't shift, got to repeat what if, you said, if, if you, have Scott, listen. I understand media campaigns. I understand marketing, and I understand how businesses understand that you can completely turn people around if you implement an aggressive media marketing strategy. If they continue with the existing strategy, they lose. If they begin to implement a hyper-aggressive strategy beginning in April, you can turn it around. What they cannot do is wait until August to go, uh-oh, we got to do something, because then you're in the danger zone, and that uh, could be very scary for them. Let me go to a break when I come back. I keep telling y'all that you can have a lot of people listen to you, but it don't mean that you're smart. That speaks to Joe Rogan. But it also speaks to all of these college co coaches, a lot of them white, who now all of a sudden are mad because the players are making this money and they ain't thinking the same way they used to. I'ma unpack that thing next on Rolling Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. business or career with Grow with Google's wide range of online courses, digital training, and tools. Gain in-demand job skills with flexible online training programs designed to put you on the fast track to jobs in high growth fields. No experience is necessary. Learn at your own pace. Complete the online certificate program on your own terms. Stand out to employers, get on a path to in-demand jobs, and connect with top employers who are currently hiring. Take one professional career certificate program, or all six. Earn a Google career certificate to prepare for a job in a high growth field like data analytics, project management, UX design, cybersecurity, and more. All professional career certificate programs must be completed by December 31st, 2024. Scan the QR code to complete the application. There are 1,000 scholarships available. Grow with Google and J. Hood and Associates. Be job ready and qualify for in-demand jobs. My name is Lena Charles, and I'm from Opelousas, Louisiana. Yes, that is Zodico capital of the world. My name is Margaret Chappelle. I'm from Dallas, Texas, representing the Urban Trivia Game. It's me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you watch. Roland Martin on Unfiltered. Since name, image, and likeness just really took over two to three years ago in college sports, ooh, Lord, these coaches and college administrators are just beside themselves. Yesterday on Capitol Hill, uh, Nick Saban testified uh, about how, man, this thing is just a problem, and it's just causing so many issues because the NCAA is trying to get Congress 
uh, to pass a bill to govern what's going on. Um, and a lot of states are like, y'all ain't got nothing to do with this here. Listen to what Saban had to say. Me, we have what do you see right now as the biggest challenges with the current Wild West? What are, many have said that the status quo threatens the long-term or even medium and short-term viability of college athletics. Is that true? If so, why? What are the challenges that, that, that you're facing right now? And I'll open that up to anyone who feels inspired. Senator I, I wanna, I'd like to ask, well, you have two people, I think, on the front lines, Mr. Byrne and my dear friend and Nick Saban. Um, but what has done, we call it student athletes. What has it done to the student part of the athlete? What's the chances of them graduating What's the chance of them transferring their credits as they look at the portals and jump, 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 jump? What's the purpose of collectives that basically are out there and not in contact with it, not coordinating with the schools? All the things that we think, I, I truly believe it's going to destroy the student athlete as we have known it. But on the other hand, I think there could be a, a balance. So I'd love to hear from, from Coach and from Mr. Byrne. Basically, on the front lines, you've gone through it. So how do you all look at it? Nick, what do you think, buddy? We know, but basically, um, I always did what I did as a coach. Microphone. Turn your microphone, microphone, brother. People be more successful in life. So you're trying to develop value-based system, uh, just like a value-based business that would create opportunities for young people to be more successful. So this started with personal development. It started with academic support to make sure guys graduated and had the, and prepared themselves for when they couldn't play football. And uh, also the whole concept of branding uh, and making sure you had an image out there that was gonna be something that would be, uh, enhance your chances of being successful and create opportunities for your future and see if you can develop a career as a football player. Now, what we've done between um, freedom to transfer and creating a free agency system where guys can transfer whenever they wanna transfer and um, the whole idea that we've created a pay for pay play um, sort of um, model in college athletics have created some issues in being able to actually have a program and a system that would enhance those very values that I just talked about. And how does this even impact other sports uh, relative to Title IX, uh, relative to non-revenue sports, and how do we continue to create some kind of a model moving forward where we do improve the quality of life of the student athlete, but create some kind of a balance in terms of uh, competitive balance, uh, which all venues have some guidelines and rules that create some kind of competitive balance, which right now we don't have in college athletics. It's whoever wants to pay the most money, raise the most money, buy the most players, is gonna have the best opportunity to win. I don't think that's the spirit of college athletics. I don't think it's ever been the spirit of what we want college athletics to be. So um, that's my major concern, the combination of pay for play, free agency, and how that impacts development. And I can attest that I've had two NFL coaches tell me, and this is a football deal because they're concerned about the football part, that the players come to them less developed, uh, with more entitlements and less resiliency to overcome adversity. And these are concerns that they have even in their football development. Well, if that's true in their football development, is that true in other parts of their development, whether it's academics or personal development? And each time you transfer, you minimize your chances of graduating by probably about 20%. Now we have guys transferring two or three times. So, so some of the goals and objectives of what we've worked so hard for the last 20 years to improve graduation rate, to improve health care for players, to have mental health care for players, all the things that we work so hard to improve on, we're going to start seeing slide in the wrong direction because we've created a, 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 an environment uh, that really does not promote personal development or uh, that is going to create success for their future. You know, one, one question I have to ask, uh, you just retired from a amazingly and historically significant coaching career. How much did the current chaos and state of the law contribute to your decision to retire now? Well, 
all the things that I believed in for all these years, 50 years of coaching, no longer exist in college athletics. So it's always was about developing players. It was always about uh, helping people be more successful in life. Uh, my wife even said to me, we'd have all the recruits over on Sunday uh, with their parents for breakfast. And uh, she would always meet with the mothers and uh, talk about how she was going to help and uh, impact their um, sons and how they would be well taken care of. And she came to me, you know, like right before I retired and said, why, why are we doing this? And I said, what do you mean? She said, all they care about is how much you're going to pay them. They don't care about how you're going to develop them, which is all what we've always done. So why are we doing this? So, you know, to me, that was sort of a red alert that we really are creating a circumstance here that is not beneficial to the development of young people, which is why I always did what I did. Um, my dad did it. I did it. Um, so... And that's the reason that I always like college athletics more than the NFL is because you had the opportunity to develop young people. So, and I, I want their quality of life to be good. I think, as I said before, name, image, and likeness is a great opportunity for them to create a brand for themselves. Um, I'm not against that at all. Um, but to come up with some kind of a system uh, that still can help the development of young people, I think is paramount to the future of college athletics. So ESPN Scott Van Pelt, this is what he had to say um, about this as well. Naturally, the reaction to Saban's comments on social media was measured. Oh, so you get to care about money and they don't. I get the point, but keep in mind that this man is the all-time winningest coach in the sport in terms of titles, and he's working. He's, he's a professional, so that's why he gets paid all the dough. It's fantastic that players get to make money now. But every single coach and every single revenue sport, if you're paying attention, is saying the same thing. This is the only thing that any recruit is asking about now when they come on visits. And I don't believe that it's pearl clutching to wonder if maybe that's not ideal. Maybe something about the school and your development there as a human being ought to count as part of your process and your, your line of thinking because overwhelmingly these athletes are going to have to find a job which isn't football when they leave. Sure, get your money, but there's, there's more to it. At least you're supposed to be, right? All right. So, ooh, all of these coaches and all of these sports, and this is what they're now saying. I would love to use a phrase that's rich um, because there's no pun intended. But I'm a little hard-pressed because you, you heard what Scott just said there. Well, you know, people brought up what Nick is making and he's working. The players aren't working. For all of y'all who are watching and listening, for two years, I worked for the Texas a University Athletic Department in the video laboratory. I saw what it was like on the inside. I heard the comments that coaches made. I was quite familiar with players getting paid by alumni. It's one of the reasons why we got put on probation after Jackie Sherrill was no longer a coach. Nick Saban, oh my God, he's won so many national titles. Can we stop playing games? Alabama has long paid their players under the table. Most major schools. You just heard Ted Cruz go, oh, it's the Wild Wild West out here. Really? I remember when there was a guy named Hart Lee Dykes who played for Oklahoma State, went to the NFL was one of the top wide receivers. Hart Lee by himself put about eight schools on probation. Because they were all offering him money, cars, and everything. SMU, TCU, Texas a and Texas. Te we can go, the entire Southwest Conference, the SEC, the Big Ten, the Pac-10, all of these conferences were paying players. Now we have a system where the money is no longer under the table. It's now above the table. 
And so now people are saying, oh, my goodness, you know, this is this is just, you know, this is just not right. This is just not fair. I mean, these guys, all they care about is the money. Because, see, what Nick Saban is describing are the good old days when it's about developing, you know, helping them. Guess what, y'all? All that development talk don't help nothing when most of these black kids are coming from homes where mama and daddy are working minimum wage jobs. That don't help you when you've got brothers and sisters coming up and still living in poverty. It doesn't help you when a player is sitting here watching all of these things unfold and they're sitting there going, wait a minute, how y'all making millions off of my jersey and my likeness? The reason this thing all started, because uh, Ed O'Bannon sued the in, uh, EA Sports. How y'all using my name and likeness in an EA Sports video game, and I left college? They were using Oscar Robertson's name and likeness in an EA Sports NCAA basketball game, and hell, he had attended the University of Cincinnati in 50 years. But now all of a sudden, oh, we need to get Congress involved. We got to start regulating these things because it's the haves and the have-nots. And somebody played a video of Deion Sanders saying, well, if these things continue, what's going on with the little guy, the HBCU? Let me be real clear. The HBCU couldn't compete when they were playing with, they were getting money under the table. Can we please stop this nonsense? And by the way, isn't this America? I thought America is capitalism. But now, all of a sudden, the free slave labor that developed a multi-billion dollar system is now saying, where my money at? Run me my money. I'm trying to secure the bag. See, if I got to really break this thing down, Angel Reese, who plays for LSU, wishes she had four more years in college. You know why? Angel Reese right now is making more money at LSU than she is going to make when she leaves LSU and goes to the WB WNBA. If you're a women's basketball player, to actually get paid, you got to go overseas. If we really want to start running this thing down. So I don't want to hear some coach making uh, all this money. Go to my iPad. In 2023, Nick Saban was the best paid coach in sports, making $11.1 million a year. Oh, I didn't bring up the, the country club. I didn't bring up uh, the loans for the cribs. Are y'all also aware of the number of car dealerships that Nick Saban owes, built off of him winning at Alabama, the Mercedes dealership, and the other dealerships, all built off of that mostly black talent running up and down the field on Saturdays? Y'all, come on. Come on. So now the players finally are getting money. Oh, now we've got to regulate this because this is not right. These collectives, and he's getting 100, and he's getting 500. When you now have assistant coaches in college who are getting paid two, three, four million dollars, five million dollars, assistant coaches, and all of a sudden, the black athletes getting paid. Now we got to change the system. Y'all heard anybody say, "Let's change the tennis system." How many young kids been getting paid professionally in tennis? How many young kids playing baseball being getting paid? Do I need to bring up all of these non-black sports? We ain't, wasn't nobody calling for Congress to pass laws to regulate these things. Ooh, the coaches are telling me the players are coming in underdeveloped. Why? Because they're now getting paid? Isn't that the job of a coach to coach them, even in the pros? I call bullshit on all of this. 
This is all about black bodies now getting compensated for their talent and a bunch of mostly white people are angry that they no longer can dominate signing players and sit them on the bench, Nick Saban, for two to three years and say, maybe you'll get your shot when you're a junior or a senior. Now the players are like, hell, run me my money. Because we know mostly all college players, a small percentage goes to the NFL. So if I have an opportunity to make half a million to a million or two million dollars in college, cut me the check. Let me go to my panel. Robert, what say you? Well, you're, uh, as most deaf said, you start keeping pace, they start switching up the tempo. Uh, and it's pretty clear that's exactly what we're seeing with many of these major coaches because amazingly, the minute players start having some choice and having some uh, uh, ability to have agency and actually have money and don't have to put off all some of the draconian rules and don't have to, uh, as you said, sit on the bench for two or three years and abide by these NCAA um, investigations, et cetera, all of a sudden those great coaches aren't as great anymore and they have to retire. I thought Nick Saban was a master recruiter. Can't you just go down there and say, rah, 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 Alabama, Alabama, and they come, and then you host your whole NFL roster? No, that's never been what happened. The, the, the boosters from these major schools where we go to poor black communities, pay these players, uh, uh, buy mama a house, buy mama a car, something along those lines. And that's how you end up with a team like Georgia a few years ago, where we had Todd Gurley at running back, Nick Chubb at running back, Sonny Michelle at running back, all at the same time. It's not because of recruiting. It's because we were pay they were paying the players. But now that the uh, ball is in the hand of the players proverbially, and they can control their name, image, likeness, how much money they make, and you have to actually play to keep your uh, social media clout high enough to make money off it, which means I got to get into the transfer portal and actually be on the field and I can make as much money on the field for the Cincinnati Bearcats as I can make in Alabama sitting on the bench. Well, then they are not. Uh, these coaches don't know how to control that situation. What we're seeing is exactly what happens when they start preaching to us this idea of the American meritocracy. We can't have DEI. We can't have affirmative action because everybody needs to get what they deserve based off of merit. When we start putting merit onto systems that have always been built off of imperialism, colonialization, and nepotism, all of a sudden we're seeing who really has the merit in the system. And see, I'm about to really mess you up on this one, Scott. Do you know what a lot of people out here don't realize? Some of these collectives, some of these collectives are requiring the players to kick back a percentage of their future earnings for the next Joe. 10, I'm, not, I'm trying to tell you. See, people, see, everybody out there, and I have gotten this directly from athletes and their families and from some of the universities. Some of the collectives are requiring, oh, we'll give you this quarter of a million dollars, but it's really a loan. They're requiring them to sign deals saying you will kick back a percentage of your future career earnings, sometimes upwards of the next 20 years, back to the collective. For, oh, you, that's a record label advance. <laughs> and I'm telling you what I know. Uh, what I know. You know, okay, so... That, you're absolutely right. That, that's a bad deal. I don't know anybody that would yeah, it's do an awful, that. It's an awful deal, but just understand what the game is. Exactly. But here's the part I don't understand. How come paying athletes who are poor and disenfranchised, how come just because they're getting paid, how come you still can't build men and build a brand and you're a coach, and you're the builder of men and camaraderie and team players. Because, because it's now the money. It, it's so hard now. It, 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 it's so it, it's so hard. It's so hard now. <laughs> and, and and it's hard because of the portal. 
a guy can transfer. If he doesn't like his playing time, he can leave. So what they're mad about, they're mad about that, oh, the old rules of sit your ass on the bench for two years on the third string, and then you might play in your third or fourth year where a guy was like, yo, I can bounce and go somewhere else. Now, I personally believe that, uh, that the players who switch almost every year, that's idiotic. At some point, you got to stay and compete. But the reality is, oh, I'm sorry. What was I just thinking? You do know there are coaches who go to different places every year because they are pursuing a new opportunity. So they might be yeah. a, line, a, a, a grad assistant here, and then the next year, they are an offensive or defe defensive assistant here, then they lead to become a special teams coach here, and then another job in, in, in year four. Oh, my bad. Coaches can do that, but the players, y'all can't do that. Well, players certainly can do that and should do that. But this Nick Saban and Scott Van Pelt about losing something because you're playing pay or, uh, players, that's just nonsense. Because if you're a great coach and part of your job is building men and building character and, and showing character and getting them prepared to graduate. By the way, I, I, everybody's nobody's raised the graduation rates for Nick Saban's ball players. I don't know what it is, quite frankly, but I got to tell you something. Given his statement, we ought to look at that because I'd love to know the percentage of those who graduated uh, under his 50-year career because uh, I don't. I bet it doesn't match John Wooten's at UCLA when Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was there. But the bottom line is, okay, so it may be harder to build character and to give values to these players. Then do your job. They have a right to make money just like you make money. I mean, Nick Saban we got $11 million. God damn. Oh, that's no, a lot no, of no, money no, no, per see, year. Oh, no, no, no. See, you don't even want to stay. See, no, no, no. It gets better than that. Go to my iPad. Tyler, here's the deal. ESPN signed a, a six-year, $7.8 exclusive $7.8 billion exclusive deal um, when it comes to uh, 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 the, uh, the championship. Again, $1.3 billion a year. Talek, what that's... That's only for a billion what, what a the, year. That, that's so that's, that's $1.3 billion a year. That's sure. what... And guess what? That's only five... Con hey. No, 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 no. You don't even understand. That's only five conferences. The system that is being created, Talek, that's why you're seeing... Okay, Texas and Oklahoma leaves the Big 12, go to the SEC. You saw UCLA, USC, uh, and two others leave the Pac-12 and go to the Big 10. It obliterates the Pac-12. Florida State trying to leave the ACC. This thing may... Conferences may, may no longer even exist. So this thing may come down to 30 or 40 teams competing for the money. What they don't like, Tyler, is that they now don't get to keep the money for the university and the coaches. Now they have got to spend the money on the players. And they like, damn it, we now got to pay for the free labor that built this whole thing. Exactly, exactly. And I think it goes back to the point of uh, this is just the American racial capitalism that, we, that, has, that has permeated mm -hmm. the structure of higher education from the 1600s, as we look about from, from, from plantation times, we've said before, HBCU served as a place for, for athletic success, for, for you know, educational success, but the white dominated state legislature sought ways to reform and maintain racial control over higher education. And when racial seg segregation was outlawed, generous state funders funded PWIs in their athletic departments in contrast to HBCUs uh, to, to, to legally reshape the plantation system just on a whole new level. So, so in this way, as we say, it's just a system of internal colonization where these universities and these athletic departments are buying black athletes to exploit them and to really build up a system uh, and to really to give them, you know, better scholarships and facilities than, the HB, than HBC, HBCUs could offer. Uh, but I think that this all just goes hand in hand with uh, racial capitalism that we live in day to day. Uh, last comment I'm going to make it before I go to the break uh, is this here. Taylor Branch uh, did a book. Uh, it's called the, the Cartel, Inside the Rise and Imminent Fall of the NCAA. It was an e-book. Used to be on Amazon. I think it's available now. Uh, I downloaded it uh, years ago. I had it on my TV One Washington watch show. And so uh, if you go to YouTube, you can actually see the interview. So y'all heard Nick Saban uh, kept talking about the student athlete. And y'all kept he heard Senator Joe Manchin and Senator Ted Cruz talk about the student athlete. Let me help all of y'all out. And I need everybody right now to brace yourself for this. 
the phrase student athlete was created by the NCAA by a lawyer to defend the NCAA in a court case filed against them by an athlete. Let me say this again. The phrase student athlete was not this wonderful, amazing creation of academics to put the <coughs> students first and say you're a student first and you're an athlete second. No, the phrase student athlete was created by an NCAA lawyer to defend the NCAA in a lawsuit that was filed by a player. If you think I am lying, I want y'all to do this here and go get this book uh, by Walter Byers. Give me a second. I'm going to pull up in a second. This is the last thing. And see, see this is what happens, y'all, when you know how to read. Walter Byers is kind of important. You know who he is? He's run the NCAA. Go to my iPad. This is the book that he published. I got a copy of it. It is called Unsportsmanlike Conduct, Exploiting College Athletes. It was published in 1997. Charles Walter Byers, who was the executive director of the NCAA from 1951 to 1987, exposes the real deal, and you see it right here. In the book, Byer exposes, as only he can, the history and present-day state of college athletics, monetary gifts, questionable academic standards, advertising endorsements, legal battles, and the political manipulation of college presidents. Byers believes that modern-day college sports are no longer a student activity. They are a high-dollar commercial enterprise, and college athletes should have the same access to the free market as their coaches and colleges. That, y'all, is from the man who led the NCAA for 36 years. All due Nick Saban, I don't want to hear that BS. Pay the players just like y'all are getting paid. And your job and the other coaches is to figure out how to coach in a new system in a new day because y'all have been exploiting free labor, mostly black labor, for all of these years. Going to a quick break, we come back. Joe Rogan shows all of his whiteness, and I'll explain. You're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037- 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hello, I'm Paula J. Parker. Judy Proud on the Proud Family. Louder and Prouder on Disney Plus. And you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> Joe Rogan has the most popular podcast in the country. Uh, he gets more people downloading, listening, and watching him than a lot of the networks do. Uh, and it's a lot of people listen to him, a lot of black folks listen to him, and a lot of white folks. But guess what? 
his whiteness shows all the time. A video circulated today about some comments that he made regarding uh, the uh, Biden-Harris administration and diversity. Well, when we looked into it, the comments actually were made a year ago. They only played about a 30-second clip on, um, on social media, but I had my staff pull about a minute and a half. Listen to this, y'all. It's bizarre how far he's deteriorated. And I, you know, when I was talking about it during the, the election uh, and people were like, uh, I was actually talking about it with Eric Weinstein and he was like, uh, I mean, I can't vote for Biden. And he goes, I can't vote for Trump. And I go, I would vote for Trump before I'd vote for Biden. Just because I think with Biden, like he's no, he's, he's gone. Like, you know, he's gone. It's you're going to be relying on his cabinet. And I knew his cabinet would be this fucking sideshow of diversity and which is exactly what it is. I mean, that, that one person who stole all the women's clothes oh, yeah. that Sam Brinton, we, we highlighted on the podcast yesterday. Like, that's a diversity hire. You, you just said, oh, look at this. A man who dresses like a woman and has a beard and a mustache, but also wears lipstick. This is perfect for us. I don't give a fuck what this guy's good at or bad at. I don't give a fuck what their credentials are. This makes us look like we're inclusive. This makes us look like we're on the right side. So let's let's hire this person. And that those are the you can't have those kind of people running a Ben and Jerry's. You, <laughs> you certainly can't have those kind of people running the fucking most powerful government the world's ever known. It's nuts. It's nonsense. Hmm. Okay. Those kind of people. Now you noticed how Rogan is that. Old diversity stuff. Now, the person he brings, he only mentions one person, uh, and that is uh, this guy, Sam Britton, who is a, who's not dumb, he's a great guy, and who's a clear engineer. So, what happened was um, he was accused of multiple airport thefts, thefts that is, stealing clothes of, of women at airports. Uh, if you go to my iPad, uh, you'll see he was the You guys got me? All right, he was the lead nuclear uh, he was uh, the lead guy. I don't know what's going on. Can y'all please can you hear me? All right, so I don't know what's going on. Come on. All right, y'all, I got some microphone issues, so what's going on? This it? Y'all got me now? Do you have me now? Come on. Testing one, two, this mic working? All right. All right, folks. So, so Rogan is talking about this guy, this white guy, Sam Britton, Brenton, uh, white guy, gay. Uh, who was arrested for stealing uh, the clothes of women at uh, a couple of airports. Um, and so now Rogan was discussing this in March of 23, uh, and the guy left the Department of Energy uh, in 2022. So, uh, so he, here's Rogan talking about, see, uh, see you, you wouldn't have these things. Really? Um, does, does Joe Rogan uh, remember when um, uh, a racist... Trump speechwriter was forced to force out of the administration. First of all, Joe Rogan clearly is not smart because he referred to uh, Biden's cabinet. That guy wasn't in Biden's cabinet. Uh, now, Biden's cabinet is far more diverse than Trump's. So what basically is, what are you saying, Joe Rogan, that a diverse cabinet means they are less qualified? Hmm, that's kind of interesting. So really, what are you saying? I mean, because here's the deal. I mean, I remember this vividly. Uh, Trump speechwriter uh, fired amidst national amidst scrutiny of appearance with white nationalists. Yeah, I remember that. Just show the headline, y'all. Come on, I remember that. Trump speechwriter fired. So, 
Is that kind of diversity you want, Joe Rogan? Is that what you want? I mean, there were, there were other people who, I remember Ryan Zinke, who was the uh, uh, Interior Secretary, forced out because of his dealings. How many people were fired or forced to resign under Trump? Under Biden, only two cabinet secretaries have resigned thus far. Marty Walsh resigned to take another job. He was labor secretary. And Marsha Fudge just resigned as HUD secretary. Her last day is March 22nd. Two, how many people were fired under Trump? How many chief of staffs were let go? Uh, how many uh, press secretaries? We can go on and on and on. The sheer incompetence of the Trump administration. But see, for Joe Rogan, He's a white man who wants to attack others. And so, Joe, do you remember this, Joe? See, I love it how Joe wants to attack the diversity uh, of uh, Biden. Um, how many of y'all remember this? Robert, Scott, uh, Tyler, y'all might remember this here. Um, I remember during the Bush administration, one of his top executives, one of his top executives, I mean, I'm talking about Top, a the White House policy advisor. Go to my iPad. It says ex Bush aide admits shoplifting is fined. His name is Claude Allen. Claude, Claude Black, top Republican. He was shoplifted from Target. Oh, so I guess those things don't happen in Republican administrations, right, Joe Rogan? Here's what this all is about, y'all. White men like Joe Rogan want a world that is white, male, heterosexual. That's the world that they want. So they are attacking everything as diversity, everything is woke, as if white folks don't screw up. And they do, and we know they do. So Rogan shows his whiteness. He shows his racist, sexist views, and he also shows that he ain't smart because the guy he's criticizing, he's not a cabinet secretary. But then again, when your fame came from a show where they ate cockroaches and lizards and all kind of other stuff, I wouldn't call you smart anyway. Not the least, not the least bit. So y'all don't keep listening to him. I've never listened to his show. And I would dare a Joe Rogan to book people with brains on his show because clearly he doesn't have much above his neck. Robert? Well, look, I, I, I think it's interesting to me that when they talk about diversity, they make it seem like somebody cannot be non-heterosexual, cisgendered, white male and have any qualifications. But yet and still, there's no conversation about Lara Trump being the chair of the RNC now, uh, not based on any skills, qualifications, or ability. She just happened to be married to the former president's son, and therefore she gets the top job in the Republican Party. They say nothing about Jared Kushner overseeing peace in the Middle East, uh, not based on any ability that he has, but just based on being married to the president's daughter. Who got Are into you know? college because his daddy wrote a check. Exactly. It's interesting to me that everything, just like we were saying in the sports segment, everything is a meritocracy in America. You're supposed to get things and just pull yourself up by your own bootstraps until it comes to nepotism, until it comes to white privilege, until it comes to white supremacy. Then those things are completely fine to be factors in making sure that people are successful. There's a reason that wealthy white families stay wealthy white families for generations on end. And I think that part of the conversation that has to happen is that we need to learn how to completely ignore voices like Joe Rogan. and But it becomes difficult because that same clip that you uh, played earlier, Elon Musk retweeted or re-exed or re-whatever it was because he now uh, has hopped on this train uh, being, diver uh, being against diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, or anything that promotes uh, anything besides this kind of Joe Rogan worldview. Look at what's happening in Florida where uh, where they're passing laws, making sure that you can't have anything involving diversity. The entire conceptualization is, as you wrote in your book, White Fear, as we get closer to this place where black people are actually getting closer to equality, they are putting up every wall around them to make sure they can insulate white supremacy to the traditional American values that they 
like to talk about, and that being their one level of uh, achievement for white people than everybody else below that. Tyler? Yeah, I'll, I'll echo those same points. I think, you know, the, the, the president made a, a, uh, a to diversify his cabinet, and he just did that. And I think it represents, you know, who America is right now. But And for Joe Rogan to say that is just like, we, we look at a, a, a Donald Trump, who was president of the United States, leading, you know, the, the White House, who uh, put on put out a front page of the New York Times calling for the exonerated five to be to be to, to be murdered or who 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 were was attacked with, you know, many lawsuits uh, 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 violating the Fair Housing Act and, and not and not, you know, renting to, to black tenants. So and so. To say that they are unqualified, but yet uh, this this, pre this president, former president, who is more than unqualified with a RICO case out against him, is it, it just doesn't make doesn't make sense to me. And so what you see here, uh, Scott, again, and, and Scott, we're seeing this thing now in corporate America, law firms, where really what you have is they have this view of oh, it's whoa, it's just so rough for us white men uh, because guess what? We no longer get to control this thing. We don't get to run this thing. We don't get to have all of the jobs, all of the power. Damn you, Biden, for having the audacity uh, to hire uh, some non-white men like us. Yeah, it, it's so much to unpack that you can't do it in a couple of minutes. Their white privilege, when they need to share equality and diversity and access, it's if they believe that they're giving up something that they earned and they didn't. They didn't earn their white privilege. It was given to them. That's the first thing. Second of all, most white people who talk about racism or diversity and equity and inclusion don't have a clue because they've never experienced diversity, but they, more importantly, they never experienced racism. So how can you define racism to someone like me, despite my professional success, experiences racism every day? How can white people talk about the top 10 things on a day-to-day -day basis in their life that bugs them or is a problem for them? In the top 10, racism is never on their top 10. You know what racism is on someone as black or brown? It's in the top three. And so I don't, I don't listen to white people when they talk about racism and diversity and inclusion because they don't know anything about it. And they devalue it or defile it and simplify it by saying, you just pick somebody black so you could have your diversity numbers. Diversity and equity and inclusion has never been about the color of your skin or your sexual orientation. It's been about competence, right? Then you happen to be black or you happen to be gay or you happen to be a woman because of past racism, we need equality and to have an equal team because we've been barred for so long. And that's okay. That's okay because a diversity team, a diverse team, is a more high achieving team. A diverse team has not just diversity of color and character, but it's diversity of thought process and life experiences that make whether it's a company or a law firm or accounting firm better functioning organization. But white men who believe they have to give up something to share equality with black people, they have to defile it as something base and stupid and ignorant. It's none of those things, so they should stop talking about it. Well, again, so let me just say this here to Joe Rogan, uh, and just like I said to the white racist, white supremacist Richard Spencer, uh, and to all the rest of y'all white folks out here, we ain't going nowhere. Y'all are more than welcome. Y'all are more than welcome to take your ass back to Europe. You can go to you can go to Ireland. You could go to France, Germany, Poland. Take whatever damn country. Matter of fact, y'all white folk like Joe Rogan, y'all can go hang out with Putin in Russia because we know he a white nationalist too. But let's be real clear: we built this shit, and we ain't going nowhere. And y'all gonna have to get used to the fact that we are the generation that the white plantation owners never wanted to see. Negroes who can read. And it's messing y'all up. It's messing y'all up that we are kicking y'all ass every single day. Now, Joe, you down there in Austin. I got my cowboy boots on. I will be happy, Joe Rogan, to come on back home, walk into your studio, Put this on, 
have a conversation, and literally whoop your ass rhetorically and show you what diversity looks like. Holler at a brother when you're ready to have that conversation. Tyler, Robert, Scott, I appreciate it. Thanks for being on today's show. Always good to have y'all for the conversation. Folks, hold tight. We're not going anywhere. I'm chatting with TMF next. They break out their new album on Friday. We're going to have a listening session. Y'all get first dibs at their new album. Next, Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Blackstone Network. Back in a moment. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Talk about blackness and what happens in black culture. We're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Terry and I, we couldn't play in the white clubs in Minnesota. It felt like such a, uh, you know, strength through adversity type mm -hmm. moment that I think black people just have to go through, you know. We have to figure it out, you know. Right. We make we make you know lemons out of lemonade. But there's a reason we rented a ballroom, did our own show, promoted it, got like 1,500 people to come out. Clubs were sitting empty. They were like, "Where's everybody at?" And they said, "They're down watching the band you wouldn't hire." So it taught us not only that we had to be we had the talent of musicians, but we also had the ta had the talent of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a seat at the table. It's like, no, let's build the table. That's right. We got to build the table. And, That's right. And that was the thing. And of course, after that, we got all kinds of offers. Of course. Right, to come play in the clubs. But we didn't do it. We You're said, like, now we're good. No, we're good. We're good. And that's what put us on a path of national. And of course, when Prince made it, then it was like, okay, we, we see it can be done. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Democracy in the United States is under siege. On this list of bad actors, it's easy to point out the Donald Trumps, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, or even the United States Supreme Court as the primary villains. But as David Pepper, author, scholar, and former politician himself says, there's another factor that trumps them all and resides much closer to many of our homes. His book, is Laboratories of Autocracy, a wake-up call from behind the lines. So these state houses get hijacked by the far right, then they gerrymander, 
they suppress the opposition, and that allows them to legislate in a way that doesn't reflect the people of that state. David Pepper joins us on the next Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm Faraji Muhammad, live from L.A., and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Dee Barnes, and on the next Frequency, Professor Janelle Hobson joins us to talk about hip-hop and its intersection with feminism and racial equality, plus her enlightening work with Ms. Magazine and how the great Harriet Tugman connects with women in hip-hop. So it was not hard for me to go from Harriet Tubman to hip-hop, honestly, because it is a legacy of, of Black women's resistance and Black women supporting our community. That's what Harriet Tubman did. That's on the Frequency on the Black Star Network. It's John Murray, the executive producer of the new Sherry Shepard Talk Show. This is your boy, Irv Quake. And you're tuned in to Roland Martin, Unfiltered. All right, folks, welcome back to Roland Martin, Unfiltered, here on the Black Star Network. Joining us in the studio... Brothers from TMF, their new album drops on Friday. Uh, so joining me in the studio on Congos and Vocals, got Rome, what's happening? How you doing? We got uh, in Keys and Organ, Daniel Witherspoon. Witherspoon, I'm sorry. Yeah. Lead guitar uh, and vocals, Jubu. We got Chris Walker, lead vocalist. <laughs> Calvin Napper on drums. Bear Williams, uh, bass, guitar, and vocals, and joining us via Skype. Uh, he must have been late to the airport, couldn't get here. Uh, Vance Taylor <laughs> on keys. So glad yeah. uh, to have you here. So uh, first off, um, the, the album's called Music, for, first of all, you got volume one, Music Forever. How long did it take to put this together? Oh, it was quick. It was about yeah. four months. It didn't take long. Now, not, not somebody watching like, that's quick? That's quick. <laughs> Normally, how long does it take? That's it quick take, for a, It could take up to a year. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Easily. Yes. Easily. Easily. Or longer. Yeah, yeah songs, songs came in quick. We all agreed on them. The energy was good. And we went in, cut them, and it was done. It was and quick. last time y'all were here, uh, y'all said everybody was, like, doing different stuff. Everybody was right. Everybody was doing stuff. So uh, so what? Was it, was it like a virtual album in terms of... And, and how were y'all communicating uh, this whole time? Oh, no, we were all in the studio at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the energy and the synergy was right there. All right. So in the moment, we were even created yeah. a song in the moment. Yes, okay. some of the yeah. songs were were pre-written by Chris. A couple of the songs, and we came in and massaged them together and brought on thing. But for the most of it, we were creating together on the yeah. spot. Yep. Yeah. And we would send, you know, um, either snippets or completed pieces or ideas via, you know, via our text feed, and everybody would chime in and say, "Yeah, that's great. Let's let's work on that." Or <laughs> Next, you know, that, one, that one needs work. A you know. song on the album. Mm -hmm. Everybody has written a song. And some singing on one track as well. Yeah. Vance, talk about that process, uh, that total collaboration. Had you ever experienced that before on working on any other project? I had. Uh, that's kind of how I drew it with uh, people I play with. But this band is just so amazingly talented. We just were able to adjust and we heard the music and we just knew what we were supposed to do. It's, you know, because a lot of us have been playing together for 20 years, or, you know, so we kind of know each other. So it was a, it was really, it was fun. And yeah, it was something I've done quite a few times. Uh, I'm reading uh, the book Respect uh, on Aretha Franklin and I've seen other, uh, other um, documentaries and books. They talked about how was she, um, with, with, with the guys Muscle Shoals, the band out from Alabama, mm -hmm. how, like, literally that's how it was coming together right. where they're sitting here and somebody plays something, oh, I like that, uh, let's do this here, and, and, and the producer was happening in real time. Right. Uh, the Motown documentary is saying, and he talked yes. about how that sort of all came together, uh, which was just quite interesting because that, that 
an average person wouldn't think that that's how it all comes uh, it all comes together. Yeah, right. Yeah, same thing with stacks. The same, you know, Steve Cropper and and um, uh, Booker T. And, you know, from the MGs. They all lived in vicinity, and so that's how that whole thing came together. So same thing, a house band, if you will, and they just come together with the artists and create, create. And know? the beautiful thing about it is. Because they've been playing together for so long, I'm the new guy in, in the picture, it's like instantly he knows what to play. These guys, uh, the two keyboard players, they, they know how to compliment each other and stay mm -hmm. out of each other's way. And then Juba will come in and just put the glue there. And then Rome, I mean, so it's just like everybody just contributes their part to it and it just mm -hmm. somehow it comes together. Yeah, it it does. just works. Yeah. It really does. It's like a good relationship. And again, I, I've, I've, I've read and, and I've watched so many different things and read so many different books on music, uh, probably because I played cornet in elementary school, bass, mm -hmm. baritone, horn in junior mm -hmm. high and high school. Mm -hmm. Brother played okay. trumpet, another sister played flute, one played clarinet. So music was always around. And uh, the, 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 the improvising is, is, is so important yeah. uh, because again, you hear something and then you hear something and that takes you to go somewhere else and all of a sudden you're like, no, 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 go back to that. Uh, was that how it was in, in terms of just, and then it just began to spark other things in each one of your minds? Absolutely, because it's like the, these guys, you don't tell them what to play because they've played so many different genres of music. You just sit back and just watch what they're gonna do and blow your mind. Or, That's how it was for me anyway. <laughs> or one song in particular, and you may not remember this, but you, um, I was trying to come up with a guitar part and you were like, you remember what Ray Parker did on such and such? Right, 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 right. And right. I was like, yeah. oh, okay, not Ray, give me Jubu, but make me mm. feel that. Right. right. Mm. Yeah. That, that, and I was like, wow, you're <laughs> absolutely right. And mm -hmm. we did it and then locked it in. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Van, she would try and jump in, go ahead. No, I'm just saying I would I totally agree. Uh, that's uh, that's what we did. Uh, Chris would come up with an idea, and we would just kind of hear it and play what we felt on it. You know, just it was really, really, really good, really inspiring. We're gonna go through all. It's nine tracks in this, right? Yes. So we're gonna go through yeah. all nine. So, uh, guys, tee up. And I want to hear. Let me love you. Hey. hey. <laughs> Listen, let me tell you, girl, what I really want to do for you tonight. Cause you're looking fly. You've been on my mind. Who wrote Let Me Love You? All right, what's it about? What's it about? It's about this dude and this girl trying to get to her, and then it's all of a sudden he notices that she's acting kind of strange. But he's saying, hey, if you want to be with me, you got to open up your heart and let me love you. Let me love you. Now, is this a, a fictitious song, or is this a nonfiction song? Well, you know, I have a, a, a gift of uh, hearing somebody's story, and I can put it into a song. Okay, all right. So what, me. It, what, what your story? Because I'm... I, I'm just trying to tell you. I mean, it, 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 my wife. It, it could have been experienced from 35, 40 years ago. I'm just checking. Really, really, no. I'm just checking. Just checking. Actually, you know? it's, it's medicine for someone. Hello. There yes. You go. Yes. Exactly. It's medicine for someone. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, and so um, when uh, you first heard it or saw it, anybody could jump in. Uh, what'd you feel? What do you think? I, I loved it. I mean, the first time I heard it, we were actually in the studio recording some other things, some of the earlier things, and he he played it for us. Mm -hmm. I was like, I got it. Let's go. Yeah. And, and I wasn't it, recorded that And day. it makes it easier when you have this caliber of musicians. Again, they've been together so long. It makes so, it really easy. And when you presented it, did you only present the lyrics, or did you also present the music. No, I, I presented the, a demo of it. Yeah, the full with it, the music yeah. and everything. His yeah. demos sound like records. Like he, he'll present right. us a record and say, "Yeah, exactly." Play my record. The beauty, the beauty for me was that he doesn't play guitar on his records, so I'm the one that didn't have to didn't have a road map. Mm -hmm. I was free. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, everyone else kind of had a roadmap. But, but wait a minute. Now, but, but, but I'm an advocate for 
bring your thing to the table. Absolutely. This, totally, is, this totally. is the basic what I, yeah. I'm able to do, but do your thing to yeah. it. Like, Absolutely. Like all those little nuances that he finds in there, it's magic. Yeah, that I wasn't mean, on the demo, what you yeah, just heard. Yeah, yeah, that, that, or his drum that, room, yeah. how he put those grace notes in there. Bear, how he attacks the... It's, right. it's, it's, well, and, but the, the, reason, the reason I asked that, because when I watched... The uh, the documentary on We Are the World, mm. uh, and mm. Lionel Richie said, "What's amazing is Michael Jackson could not play an instrument, mm -hmm. but he actually <clears throat> hummed every part of it." Yes. He said, "So Absolutely. he would hand the tape, and he's like, oh no, no, I want this part, this part, this part, this part.'" Mm -hmm. And he's like, "So he knew exactly how he wanted it to go, mm -hmm. but he didn't actually play an instrument. Yeah. Right. So he couldn't tell you how to play it, but right, he know right, damn right. well what was in his head." He had his right, super right, right. ear. Yeah. He had a super ear. Yeah. In fact, I don't read or write or play anything other than the congas, but I've written a song on this album as well. And what I did was just that. Mm -hmm. We live in the same area, mm -hmm. and I went over to him and just gave him what I heard as an intro to a guitar line. And like how? Okay, first of all, what song was that? Choices. Choices. Choices? Choices? Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and play Choices. Do, 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 do. That's how I came mm. in. So listen to this man. Did, did you hum it? Did you? Yeah. yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. He had to actually. He's, he's, he's a little. Bring it down. Bring it down. He's a little out of out of context because he it was on tape. He sang this on the tape recorder. Got it. In this day and age, <laughs> and he played this tape recorder. I ain't gonna let that change. Well, well, what it is? That what, 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 what it he, is? Didn't, he didn't say he brought a flash drive. No. He like he brought well, a tape recorder. Well, well, what it is? <laughs> when 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 no, no. Well, when you when you turn almost seventy five, yeah, you forget things and how they were yeah, at that time. Joking, right. But it's Max basically it was up. the idea came from. Me to him. But yeah. but you still came with a tape recorder. It was. Well, I sang on the tape and said, "Gotcha." So yeah, but it was easy. Now we, that you had to go find a tape recorder to play it. No, no, no. Or he brought it. He just brought okay. it. Okay. We figured it out, and he he hummed this melody. He wouldn't stop humming this guitar melody but brother for weeks. Martin, on the same note, I I did a rest in peace. I did a, a record with Andre Crouch. He did the same I thing. Believe it. Andre Crouch came with a micro cassette player, mm. and he had a whole bag full of these micro cassettes, <laughs> and it was for Tata Vega. So he kept putting it. You don't like that one? Hold on. <laughs> and he did put another <laughs> micro. <laughs> so <when he's... laughs> yeah, but it was stuck. Doing that wrong. He knew he knew what his storyline was. Right. He already heard the the bass movement, but he couldn't play it. But he could hum it to me. Yeah, he so it, 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 he knew there. what he wanted. To, but he's like, I know what's in my head. Yeah, absolutely. I'm about to hum this thing, but I know how, how I want this to be played. And absolutely. I also wrote the lyrics. Got it. You gonna say something? Not one thing. <laughs> <laughs> so y'all so, so, gotta say it. So before we started, y'all, so before we started, before we do in the break, they all told him, don't come in here giving no one word answers like last time. And he said, okay. So he decided to come here and not say shit. <laughs> he, he ain't said, like, no, you ain't contributed to the conversation the only, the at all. all. The okay <laughs> was a one word answer. He said, don't come in here with these one word answers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, I was getting ready to say something. Yo, you were getting ready to say something. Everybody has talked two, three times, and you were about to say something. We were talking about when he loved me, right? But Rome, he, I was getting ready to say something and Rome started talking. When Larry was like, we, we were working on some other stuff that day, we had just finished the session. And we, me and Larry both, I was about to say that, Larry was like, yo, I'm ready to get on this right. I told Larry, and I think I told Vance too, I was like, man, I'm ready to jump on this now. Mm -hmm. You know, I hear this now, but we didn't get to, right. you know, we didn't do yeah. it. That and day. another yeah. piggy, piggyback thing, a lot of people may not know this, but Chris plays bass. So the bass part for a living. Yeah, exactly. Your exactly. Okay. So his bass part was the, the essence of what I played was already there. I just put myself mm -hmm. into it. 
And so, so that's you know, like you said, he he brings records to the to the thing. And yes. just, just just check check out my record. All right, yeah. I want y'all to now play. Uh, I'll never let you go. Mm. Turn it up. Motion. What, what? Explain that. I was telling that that snare sounds like it's ten feet tall. Like, okay. We were just talking about the mix of the mix. No, no, of, I got you. Mm -hmm. It's a certain sound. You gotta understand, this... Roland. We're 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 excited, and no offense to where we just came from. We've been playing the same music for 25 years. Right. Absolutely. You know, we've been playing the same music. When you guys, we guys with Frankie Beverly. Yes. Makes. For 20 plus mm -hmm. years, 55 years for him. So we're just we're the the nuances of the right. new stuff. No, I get it. We're just commenting on you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I, I get yeah. it. And you and you, and you and you and you were responding. Yeah. He we, we were just saying. You said your ass can talk again. <laughs> <laughs> this ain't going well for you, dog. <laughs> right. It's like I, I don't forget <laughs> nothing. Y'all just looking like this. <laughs> I don't forget nothing. Just like if you don't forget a beat, I don't forget nothing. No, Roland, there's certain textures like that comes with like with certain songs. So we needed a snare. Daniel was like, you know, he's kind of slightly producing too. So he's like, man, we need something. I need a snare. This, we need a bigger snare for the song. I was like, okay, I got it. So we went in. I went in the studio, detuned it a little bit until we got it what we wanted. And he's like, that's it. I was like, who wrote this song? Chris. Chris. There's a story behind this. And what's the story? I actually. Went to Hawaii for a week by myself. Yep. My wife cleared it, and I said, I just need to get away. I said, I want to go and try to work on something for 10. Right, well, my wife cleared it. She, she did. Absolutely. He's like, I had to run it by. Oh, I wouldn't have been able to I'm just checking. First right. of all, I ain't missed that, but go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, some friends, they, they, they had a, uh, a beach house 10 feet from the beach. So, I'm in there. They gave it to me, the guest house. I'm sitting there with my keyboard. And I'm looking at the ocean and the water, and I'm just reminiscing, thinking about my wife. And this song came up. Mm -hmm. I'll never let you go. Oh, you, wow. you got on my nerves on that trip. <laughs> He's sending us videos standing oh, in the water. Singing in the ocean, sending us videos. Like, Look at me, guys. Oh, the trees. <laughs> so he was making y'all real jealous, oh, yes. huh? Yes. I, bet, I bet it was one of them cold days, too, oh, and that made yeah. it worse. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. What, what was the story behind Choices? Uh, well, it's basically something that goes across all genres in terms of you, you make a choice in life. Most people want to make choices and that excludes some people because you have, have some war-torn countries and, and countries in dire straits. But at the end of the day, I think everyone wants to have their own choice. And one of the lines in the song, if there's anything you have in life that's yours and solely yours, it's choices. Mm -hmm. So I just thought that would cross over into anything. You choose who you want to marry, children, parents, and, and the parents. Right. Some people have kids, that doesn't make you a parent. Absolutely. And yeah. life. life. I, I don't have any kids, but I've raised six of my nieces. Okay. So I get it. <laughs> and and life, life brings about scenarios where you have to make choices, you know? Yeah. Every, every um, day. And every the beautiful day. thing about choices also, everybody sings, yeah. except him. He, he decided he didn't want to do it, but, but everybody sings a mm. part of that song. Mm. It's, it's beautiful. So he doesn't sing on that song, but he sings. He can sing, but he didn't want to. We tried to get him to sing a line. He was like, no, 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 no. no, no. Why? Need to. Yeah, yeah tell him why. Because he's the producer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what he was no. like. Yeah, no, no. I'm, I'm, like, no. I'm producing this. Y'all got it. I'll make that's sure y'all sound good. I'm not going to embarrass myself in. I'll talk. 
I even tried yeah, to get him to talk on the phone. He wouldn't even talk. I told him to talk. No, you did yes, not. Yes, I did. I said, Dan, you need to at least get on there and say. But it was very choices. relatable. I don't you know. Choices. So it. it was. What, so you just moody as hell that day? No. <laughs> and so, and to be honest, <laughs> me, he actually wrote the space. music. OK. Yeah, he wrote the music. But, yeah. but to be honest with you, I was really happy for Rome because all of us are songwriters in our, in our own right. Yeah. And Rome has been with Frankie and Mays the longest, and his his um, his his accomplishments were diminished, you know. And I know about that very very well in my own history working with dif different situations. So I was most him being our senior member, I was really really happy, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. for him. Yeah. Because I know what it's like to go and bring a great song to someone and say, oh, someone says, oh, that's nice, because they didn't write it. Right. They didn't, you know. Right. So for him. Have the, have the opportunity to exercise uh, those chops. Yes. Right. Now, actually, that did happen with this song. It almost didn't make it. Exactly. Why? Because the first demo, everyone heard it, and it was like, well, we weren't quite in the in the creative space where we could see beyond what we were hearing. I think. I think they needed Chris to touch it, and when he did, it yeah. made a difference. Then it made it. It yeah. made it. It made a difference. It, it made it viable, and then we were like, like well, okay, like let's he get said in earlier, there. He brings finished songs that wasn't finished. Well, but that, but that's that's, but that's also the point of a collaborative process. Oh yeah, definitely. And, and definitely. the rally is, I mean, definitely. you put something together and it for you, you think it's finished. But uh, again, I go, I go back to. Uh, I go back to, again, all the different things um, just in memory and, and the conversations with Smokey Robinson, how things came together. I mean, he told the story. It was like, I forgot the song. They had put it out. It was out two weeks, and it was OK. What, game and, banging? And, and I forgot. <laughs> I, and, then, oh and then all of a sudden, uh, uh, oh Barry God, calls him at 3 o'clock in the morning. He's like, yo, I want to redo this song. Yes. He's like, OK, I'll see you in the morning. He's like. No, right now. Mm. So he had to go down to Motown at 3 o'clock in the morning, and they redo the song, and they put it out, and it kills. Right. Yes. But, 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 but it, again, it was, that was, he was like, Bear wouldn't let it go. Like, no, I'm just, it's, there's something, we got to do something different with mm. this song. And he said, Smokey said, it totally changes the song. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, that's, so that's really what you're describing. That's with that process, having yeah. somebody, yeah. somebody else says, no, I'm hearing this, and then you're like, Okay, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. That's pretty good. That's how it went yeah. down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly how it went down. And so, and the thing about it is, all the elements were already there. He had the lyrics already done. I just heard a different melody on top of it to make it fit with, with the music. Mm -hmm. See, that's what I think. That's what I think. Uh, I remember Jimmy Jam and uh, Terry Lewis telling me that they said, it's hard for them to listen to music because they can't actually hear what's produced because in their mind, they are remixing it mm -hmm. and they're doing right. something else yeah. with it. Mm -hmm. And I told them, I said, the reason I, I, I laugh at that because it's sort of like when, when I hear people give speeches, mm -hmm. I'm sitting here like, mm -hmm. Why did, cause, so I, I, I hear the speech totally Analyzing different. Right? It, Just yeah, like, yeah. If, like, like, like with sermons. Like my wife will tell you, uh, like when I take sermon notes, I put the date, the church, the pastor, the scripture, and the title. And if there ain't no notes, she like, you ain't feeling the sermon. I'm like, nope. Because <laughs> there are no notes. Right, right, but right, then right, if right. she sees notes, I'm actually into it. Right. Right. Same way, because I'm sitting there like, well, why did he or she go there? Why did they, why did they, okay, why did they do, why, why did they use that, use, the, why did they be funny here, serious here? So I saw that, that's you how. You can't turn that part of your mind. Oh, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Cap? Mm -hmm. Yes. He was trying to throw you the ball. <laughs> Shoot the ball. Put your ass on the bench. You, know, you ain't gonna get the game to play. Yeah, I think we better listen to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. play another damn song. Yeah, uh, oh, man, well, I tell you, he, he hold a groove though. Wow. All right. He hold a groove. Well, I, I, well, I, 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 I hope he here for a reason. I'll tell you what. Yeah, I ain't gonna even hold it. Hold on. I'll tell you what. Since everybody riding me, let's go to my song, huh? What's that? What? <laughs> That's guaranteed to make him talk. <laughs> all right, what, all right, what's your song? When the groove feels right. When the groove feels right. All right, put on uh, When the Groove Feels Right. <laughs> That's the funniest thing tonight, brother. <laughs> this is the last track on the album, number nine. Go ahead. It's not the last track. It's the next one. Oh, I, I thought it had it in the order. All right. True.
Who's on horns? Phil Lassiter. Phil Lassiter. Say it again. Phil Lassiter. He's from Dallas, but he lives in, he's in Europe now, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All uh, right, and what horn? Trumpet. Trumpet. He plays trumpet. Got it. Okay. Yeah. All right, so what is the song about? So this song is about, so back in 2020, I did a um, project and it's titled Making Moves. And um, this was one of the songs that was on that project, so it was pre-recorded. So what I did was I wrote, a, I wrote a B section for the song. These guys didn't play on it then, I had some other guys on it. And I had a sax player on it, um, had another guy singing on it. But when I wrote the song, I had always envisioned these guys playing it. So when we were like vetting songs for our record and stuff, I was like, you know what guys, I got a song uh, that I think will work, you know, perfect for us. I mean, it, you know. And so, um, I presented the song to them and they were like, yeah, this, this can work, man. I like, you know, because the, the hook is um, when, when the groove feels right, make you want to dance all night. Just keep, Just keep the keep groove. groove. And, and another thing, too, we, we, we also wanted a record that showcased the band that wasn't so vocally. Right. Yeah. You right. know, um, more instrumental versus vocal. Yes. Right. Yeah. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. With just the chant, but yeah, to showcase, mm -hmm. you know. And you will close us. Uh, this song out with an amazing solo. Yeah, incredible. Okay. We won't get to that, but come see us live. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got you, I got you. Unless you want to yeah. scroll down. You know, I ain't mad at that. But <laughs> uh, then, then, like, how, how far in it is the solo? <laughs> how far in it is the solo? Turn, 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 it, turn, turn it up. Turn it up. Yeah, turn it up. Turn it up. I let him get a little bit. It's coming right, it's coming right here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. After this. He killed this thing. In one take. He sure did. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah did. I'm gonna say what's even weirder. He did this oh. without that sound. He did it right. naked. He didn't have yeah. he didn't the have distortion. Yeah, no, no. Sound. So we had to go back and create distortion to match his guitar solo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Explain that for the audience. Meaning, the tone that it is, we didn't have access to that when we recorded it. Right. We didn't have any distortion pedals, so he had to run me through just plug in some plugins and stuff to, to make it. After the fact. Yeah. Vance, I think you want to jump in. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying, uh, it, this is the way he always does solos. <laughs> he plays everything like that. Fire. He, he just, yeah, fire. Fire. Wow. Yeah, great. So he felt it immediately. We felt it immediately. One thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. One take. One take. Hey, hey, I have hey. a video. One take. Right. <laughs> hey, ain't nothing no wrong one take. So um, I fun. think, did we play So Deep in Love With You? No, 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 that's Vance. Right. That's Vance's song. That's Vance's song. All right, so uh, play So Deep in Love with You. Come on. Great you. track. Yeah, I love yeah. it. Turn it up, turn it up. I, can y'all give me more? I need more audio. Thank you. Thank you. I've got something to say. <laughs> just just a day. Thinking of the time we met, you were looking at me, and I looked at you. Your face I just could not forget. song about? Uh, it's just the most special song. It's, first, I just needed something for the uh, for the project, and so I came up with a melody. 
and then I kind of stopped thinking about what I was going through at the time and I thought about my special person and how when I saw her how I couldn't forget her and it just kind where did you see her uh in Rome Georgia <laughs> where at the mall at the Popeyes what, what? was it at something she was wearing was it a smile what was it mostly a smile Mm. And I was just, I was taken and I just couldn't forget her. So I just came up in that particular song. That's kind of what happened. All right, well, y'all heard the song. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, uh, it went to Chris first. I think yeah, Chris he heard played, it first. Yeah, he played it for me uh, when we were in Houston. And I was like, dude, what you holding out on? Yeah, he never sent it to us. What's the deal? He didn't first of all, he goes, man, I had to come up with something. So, you know. Oh, I, 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 this is killing, dude. Let the rest of the guys yeah, I'm going to tell you what's weird is after we did it, yeah. he was ready to pull it. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Because he said the uh, the way it felt in the studio didn't feel right to him. Mm -hmm. So then we we played with it a little bit, and then uh, sent them another version. He was like, "Oh yeah, it's there." Like we were on the edge of just not making a record. Vance, you you want you you almost pulled it. Vance, you almost it's pulled a, it. Yeah, and it, I think it came through my husband's. Uh, okay, who's the, talking? You know the what? Is somebody phone on? Who? Who's, oh, that's that's Vance's phone? All right, Vance, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna call you back. How'd that happen? Uh, I don't know where that's coming through. Oh, Vance, you took a phone call in the middle of the show? No, he's trying to tell no, me. Vance, 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 was that you? Vance, can you hear me? Vance, can you hear me? His audio went away. All right, y'all call him back. Y'all call him back. <laughs> Vance in the middle of a phone call, in the middle of the show. All right. Uh, so, he, so he almost pulled it. Yeah, I almost pulled the song because he just said it didn't it didn't feel right to him after. He didn't think it fit the body of work. Right. The the body of work. I think it was the intro. Yeah, you know what it was? It was that it was, guitar intro. It was the guitar. Yeah. 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 He thought country it was country because country. the way Jubu played it in the intro, it had like a country and western. Man. No fault to him. We no, kinda, yeah. We kind of guided him to do it, mm -hmm. but. Well, the uh, intro that's on there? No, no, no. no it's no, not there. Yeah, so the no. intro before was, yeah. was more yeah. heavy, heavy me. Right. Like a like a bending kind of guitar country type of thing. Got it. Well, we scratched that, and then it's more piano bass yeah. now. And okay. he was happy with that. And Yeah. Got it. And for me, as soon as I heard it, even before we put that thing on it, I was like, man, this sounds like Toto. You know the the rock group Toto. I was like, I just I love that type of yeah. that type of uh, shuffle, shuffle yeah. tempo. Yeah, and plus Vance is a a, a groove player from yeah, yeah. way, but everything has to have that. That's locking yes. it. Solid, you know, it has to be moving in a certain He's way a for him to for him to feel it, <laughs> yeah. to feel right? It. And of yeah. course, we all want to honor each other's wishes and right. making exactly. sure that it's you know exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The other thing was that too, he couldn't feel the the loop in the beginning. that starts with the ooh, so he couldn't feel that. So he thought, no, I'm not. It's not. That's not the way I heard it. I'm not feeling. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. yeah. when 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 Daniel bought that up, Bossman, it's like, okay, yeah, that's that's yeah. it. And it does feel, it, it felt different it because good. when Jubu did, when he started it out with this, it, it sounded almost like a country song. You okay. know, that's yeah. what he thought it was well, kind of like. Country well, Western. Country Western, yeah. yeah. That wasn't Beyonce it. going, you may want to put that country yeah. back on that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. The, the remix, huh? Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm just saying. Right. Right. Volume yeah. two. Yeah. I'm just saying. All right, uh, let's play a tribute to the great ones. Oh, oh. Man. oh. yeah. Ooh. Beautiful song. Yeah, let this one do its thing, man. I need speaker up here. You know, let's just meditate while Sometimes you have to go back and give it up to the ones that paved the way for you. So if you like grown folks' music, I want you to pull out your LPs and your eight tracks and let TMF take you back for just a little while. Listen. I still remember chilling with my lady, listening to the radio. And I remember songs they would play to make us feel good, yeah. And I remember times we would stay out all night long, dancing to them love songs. I really miss those love songs, yeah, yeah. If we 
Taylor's Soul Heaven, mm. where he's paying tribute to all these artists, yeah. Yeah. imagining yeah. Uh, a soul party in heaven. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, who wrote this? Chris, Chris wrote the whole album. Chris, Chris wrote the album. Chris wrote the album. Chris wrote the <laughs> <laughs> I just kept submitting songs, and they kept saying, OK. So this <laughs> that's what I, he I didn't set out to do that, but uh, you know. Great writing. And what, and, and, uh, and what inspired you? Oh. Just thinking about all of those? All the people All those that, artists? that are gone, yeah, they've influenced me, and I just said, you know what, I, I want to honor these people, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a definitely it's a special yeah. chemistry of how this stuff comes together because even this song, the story behind this was Vance had to catch a flight, mm -hmm. and this wasn't the version of the song, right? And they they played this maybe in one or two takes, and Vance left out to go to the airport, and it was this, it came out this way, and this isn't the direction it was supposed to be. Yeah. Really? It was magical, yeah. like. Yeah, literally. because uh, yeah. it was originally like more of a big R&B program, drums, that sort of thing. And when Vance started playing it, his touch, it was like the spirit was there. So it's yeah. supposed to be a faster song? No, not faster. But more aggressive. It, when you say big, more, more aggressive with like, like more pro produced, less produced. intimate. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, yeah. This is like the unsung. This is intimate. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so Vance. What was it? You like, look, I ain't got much time, so listen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm about to hit y'all with this. Is that what it was? That's kind of what it was, man. I had to catch a flight. <laughs> so I went in and uh, kind of knocked it out real quick, and I had to go, you know, because it was a good little ways to the airport. So yeah. so I, I said, man, I got to go, and uh, I just did that last take, and it worked. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, there, All right. There's only one, a couple takes, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. But that's with take. everything. Yeah. It doesn't take us a lot of time, a lot of takes. We do a no. lot of songs, most yeah. of them, in one take. Yeah. yeah. There ain't nothing wrong with that, but you ain't trying to spend my money on studio time. <laughs> uh, Amen. Making love to the music. Cue it up. And this was a single that was out. I played nine holes today. I was playing this on the golf course. Oh, wow. Uh, fresh oh, yeah. He's in, he's in the music video. Man. That's right. That's right. Uh, he's in the music video. I'm in the music video. Yeah. Y'all put uh, what? Explain it. The first time we came, yes, yes. You, post, you posted it yes. on your thing with you dancing. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. took it and cropped it. Oh, yeah. No, I was, I was, I was jamming it. Like oh, yeah. I said, I was playing golf today. So I, I have, I, I got so many on different playlists. Uh, so I got, uh, I've got, uh, I got like three plays called Vibes. I got up tempo. I had a slow one, but the problem, I had some songs that couldn't fit either one, so I created the mid tempo. So I'm on a course today, uh, uh, jamming it. So and I turned it all the way up. I don't think that pissed me off. I didn't charge my speaker. I was like, damn it, it died up before. Uh, I was like, I this thing was charged. Well, you can always call me. And I can sing it for you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, explain this song. Making love to the music. Relationships, you know, that feels good. You know, and, and you know, with me and my wife, we've been through a lot together. So we're in a good place now. Uh, we've gone through the rough times. So now we're, we're coasting, and I think other people can maybe can relate to that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so and, and plus, that's something that's missing today. Notice in the song, it has long notes. And a, a lot of the songs have long notes. You don't right. hear singers yeah. singing long notes. I, yeah, I had right. that conversation with Ellie LeVert not too long ago. Very true. Singers don't do that anymore. So we want to bring that back. 
mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and because uh, it's something that's missing, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. Well, I think that uh, it was um, when I this probably was about three weeks ago when I saw when I saw the um, uh, when I saw again the Motown documentary. Then I went back and listened to probably about 20, 25 songs mm-hmm. and how literally every one in the first. 10, 15 seconds, you knew exactly what the song was. Mm-hmm. And it went from music right right into lyrics. Because yeah. Barry's whole deal is now, now we gonna get them. And then I looked at the time of each song. We were not talking about four, four five minute songs. Right. Those songs were, right, max. Three twenty. Uh, and so I was looking at that. And then, um, <laughs> then when uh, I was looking at uh, some uh, live, so then I went back and listened uh, to Sam Cooke live at the Harlem Square. Mm. Uh, and then I didn't realize as I was doing more research how that that album hadn't even been, wasn't even released for 30 years wow. because they did they only wanted an other Sam Cooke sound that was too black mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they were fr- they were right. they did not want that mm-hmm. Sam Cooke to go out to the public they wanted the Copa. soft they wanted they wanted the salt the right they wanted mm-hmm. the Copacabana yeah. that the soft as opposed to that Commercial. that gritty yeah. black Ground, sound. Yes. And, there you go. Yeah. Uh, and it, it was crazy. And so just so it's always interesting. And then I think when you look at when you take that Motown sound, and then you then you come right on back on top of that stack sound, which is and then one obviously is Detroit Northern. Right. Then you got that Southern Memphis. And so right. Right. it's always right. interesting just the, just the different styles mm-hmm. uh, of music. Okay. And, and I and so the reason I think this song resonates because it it's that you talk about groove it's just mm. like they're just it's just some it's it's not upbeat it's not slow i the, my phrase the phrase i use is this is a this it's a perfect uh top down sunroof open mm. on a sunny day song all right yeah, yeah, yeah. Right all right sometimes when you I just like you that. just driving and it's just because not all songs can fit. Yeah. It, you ain't yeah. trying to be yeah. slow, right. 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 but you ain't trying to be fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just trying to just to chill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Just trying to chill. That kind of song. It yeah. really is. Right, it's right. I got that grown old head groove too. Right, right. Do right. You stop. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's sexy. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, sexy. Absolutely. You know? uh, let's hear uh, new again. Mm-hmm. Bam. Come on, man. myself and Chris. Um, The original song that I brought to the band that everybody liked, it had a different... Bring it it up. I'm bringing it up. I need to keep it up. Go ahead. It had a different lyrical content at that time. Everybody liked the song, but everybody was like, well, not too crazy about where the lyric is. And so Chris said, hey, if if you don't mind, let me get a crack at, at it. What is new again? What is that? What's new again? What, what is new again is the relationship between my wife and myself. Got it. We were um, high school sweethearts. Uh, went to prom, went to military ball, all that stuff. And we lost touch. Um, my wife would say that, you know, I was, the, I was the dumb and stupid one that let her go. And we both... She would say that. Would you agree? I would certainly agree. <laughs> I'll just check it. Just check it. I mean... Absolutely. Um, so, we, you know, we were apart for, um, gosh, 37 30 years. years. Yeah, 37, 37 years. Yeah. Wow. We, we both married. You know, married, had children. We both have two adult children. And um, I was with Mays, obviously. And coming back to Chicago, which, which is my hometown, she was still living there. And she said, 
we, we, we had a friend that passed away and we found each other on Facebook because of that friend passing. And she said, hey, next time you're in Chicago, let me know, you know, because I haven't seen you play since high school. About two weeks later, it came down that we were going to be closing Taste of Chicago. So I invited her to come out to the show. And uh, what she did and brought her, brought her daughter. I, I didn't know if she had a, you know, wasn't, we weren't doing that. It right. was just, just friends. And long story short, she came to the show. We had lunch with, you know, with her daughter and things just progressed and was new again. New again. Yeah. Here we are now. And he and shared I, that story can with I, you. Can yeah. I, can I, can I yeah. back off that too? We were talking earlier about coming up with parts. This song in particular, you, you might not have checked up on the guitar. There's two guitar parts, right? There's the chang and the chang, and then there's the uh, He specifically said, give me that, give me something that lovely day. Remember that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Bill Withers. He was like, mm -hmm. that Bill Withers. And I was like, no problem. Because I totally understood. Mm -hmm. And so I just. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, when I heard the intro, I immediately thought of a Nita Baker song. Mm -hmm. That's, I, I'm trying to think the song, but when it started, I was like. He played with her. He, he made that up. Yeah. yeah. Play the beginning. Turn it up. Play the beginning love. again. Uh, uh, Sweet uh, love. No. Uh, no. I hear it too. You hear? Oh, yeah, man. There you go. Yeah. There yeah, you go. Yeah, uh, That's exactly, I was like. <laughs> that was the first thing I, that, oh, right. Oh, That's exactly, yeah. exactly what I heard. Same old love. Right. Same old love. Yeah. Same old love. Yeah. So anyway, with that story. Cool. Bring it down. You know, with the story of my, you know, my relationship, <laughs> he went in, the, went, went in the woodshed and came out with what there we you had go. here. So, yeah. you know, so, yeah. Synergy. We played other. We played uh, all the other eight songs. This is the last. So this is nine tracks on the album, right? Yes. Yeah. So this is one we haven't heard. Synergy. So Van, Van, what? That organ. Vance that Vance. organ you heard. Right, what was the organ? Yeah. Who, was, who, 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 who hit that? That was you? Yeah. Well, you tried to go to the church there? I told him to do it. Well, he's at it. I heard it. He's, he's at it. He's at it. I heard it. He comes from church. Oh, yeah. What, you, tried to, you, you just tried to relive Billy yeah. Preston right there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it felt right. It felt right. Oh, yeah. it, felt right. it felt right at the moment. Whose you know, song is this? No, that's the thing. It's a collective. We created this. Collectively. We created this on the fly. Actually, he started with a bass line. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it was, we, we argued. No, but, no, but what started, what, how, before, what, we, we were y'all just? No, nah, we needed another song just that wasn't a lyric to it. Yeah. yeah. So y'all sit, y'all sitting there, you know the song, then all of a sudden. Once he, he again. Just, he I just started with a bass line, yeah. and then we tweaked that into what you're hearing now. Yeah. So you started then, the bass line, then what happened? Well, drum groove. Drum started. Drum started. Wait a minute. Now, actually, they started <laughs> groove first. <laughs> what? And, and <laughs> I don't know if we were all spinning because we walked out of the studio, to be honest with you. And then yeah. they started playing something different. They switched it. And then I walked back in. So wait a minute. So two of them playing, then y'all yeah. like, yeah. I'm going to get playing. something to drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you come back. Yeah, then we came back. We, we heard what they were doing. We're like, oh, and that's with, something there, guys. Within, within 10 minutes, we had a song. All right, so they, so, so they play, and then who then comes in next? I think the next thing that happened was Vance that's... had an intro idea, and then we tweaked it a little bit. Van, explain that. Uh, well, we just felt it. Uh, it just kind of came, like you were talking about earlier, we were just jamming for a minute. And it kind of, kind of sounded like the time for a while. We had a groove that kind of had the time groove. And 
We tried to let it evolve. So yeah. band comes with that, then what? Uh, well, interesting, well, it, it was kind of sort of like, it just morphed. We did. created like the, the beat section. The beat section happened. Right? Mm -hmm. And then we just kind of talked our way through it as they were playing it. Yeah, he was in the mic saying, go to the bridge. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then right. stay there, yeah. Yeah. band take a solo. <laughs> yeah, matter of fact, if you hear, once you hear the song all the way through, Roland, you'll hear his directions. Oh, so he thought he was James Brown. It's great because his, his, his directions actually became they stayed on the, the part. You yeah. know, yeah. 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 this this I, I label it as his Algero color. Right, got this right. whole space. He was just he was in the room with us cutting, yeah. and mm -hmm. we kept all of it. Every and then of it. I flew in. I got in late that that mm -hmm. session. Well, I right. flew in, so my part was the last part, last part. Right. Yes. on that. Right. And we were. The st we were like Out of time. over our time limit. Yeah. Yeah. Once again, Jubu, you got one take. Mm -hmm. You like, all right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, that's it. Yeah. It's, it's a groove. Yeah. It's, a, it's a nice groove. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I came up with the name Synergy because it. Fit. Because of how the song came together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, last question. I'm gonna go around everybody. Um, and it, the question, it doesn't necessarily mean that what you wrote could be it. Uh, uh, I'll start with you, Van. Favorite cut on the album? Mm -hmm. uh, so deep in love. Oh, you know what I'm saying? All right, no, no, that's fine. That's, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. I asked the question. All right, because I. You might hear that from Well, I asked the question, but I, it's not necessarily it. Not necessarily. You know, somebody may think a little different. That's a little. Somebody may think a little different. Uh, Jubu, for you. So deep in love. Vance's tune. To be to be honest with you, it's it's um yeah, I, I love that song. Mm -hmm. From the textures to the vocals to your your the backgrounds, everything. That's that's my favorite song. Mm -hmm. Calvin. Well, I think my favorite. I I got two. Roll. Now. Damn it, you gotta pick Synergy. one. I am. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you. You gotta pick one. Right. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Now you're trying to overtalk. I'm not gonna say my song. You gotta pick one. Nah, listen, nah. Listen, I, your listen. favorite. Okay. All right. I think I think I think Rome's song has grown on me. The more that I've kind of listened to the choices, album. Uh, choices because I like the message in that song. Like okay. the message, and it. it's like it's a universal. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That like, would be my the, second. The, the, the person who never talks like a message song. Hey man. <laughs> so the song talks, so you don't have to. Okay, all right. Uh, Speaks to my spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Bear. Probably uh, tribute to the great ones. Mm. Yeah. Okay. That's that's actually my wife's favorite, so she she, she loves Daniel. Yeah. I'll never let you go is my favorite tune, mm. uh, hands down. Because uh, when we were Maze, my favorite song to play with Maze was a song called Thank You, mm. yeah. and they feel the same way yeah. to me. Mm. Do. That's without question my favorite song on the record. Mm. Chris, I, I'm leaning towards Let Me Love You mm. because the feel of it it just puts me in a in, in, a, in a good mood and I can yeah. I like. Mm -hmm. Groove into it. Mm -hmm. Rome? Yeah. My first, if I had a second, it would be tribute. All right. Now, I'm going to have to listen to the other eight for me to make that determination. I'm going to pick, <laughs> uh, but I got to listen to the other eight. Uh, and and probably I'll, listen, I'll have to listen to... Uh, well, actually, my, my music process is different because if there's some song, if I feel it, I'm like, if I feel it, I'm probably gonna listen to it at least 30 times. Uh, my, yeah, no, because my dad used to piss me off when he did this here, when we were kids. He would, he would play, he would, I remember when Sexual Healing came out, i never forget, me and my sister uh, Levita were in the kitchen. I said, he played this damn song one more goddamn time. I'm gonna break that 45. Cause it was like over and over. I'm like, man, if we hear this song one more time, and cause he had these huge speakers, it was in it was in our uh, kitchen, oh my and gosh. and it wasn't like you could go to your room cause the speakers <laughs> not here. the walls. Not here. But I was I'm like, here. so so for me, like like I'm, this is how bad, like I literally this this is no lie. There have been a couple times, like I'm talking about three months. The only thing I listen to is Maze Live in L.A. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. No, no. Okay, when I say three months, mm. I'm literally talking about every time I get in a car. Right. It, like, so I can, yeah. I will listen to a song that way. Yeah. I listen to some songs four hours straight. Oh. Mm. It's just, yeah. mm. so so I just sort of listen to music differently. Yeah. So I'm gonna have to, uh, I'm gonna, no. and then and if, if I ain't feeling it, then, then I go to the next one. Like, I'm not gonna name the artist, but he put an album out. He's one of my favorite artists, and it was only one song in the whole album of my life. I don't even, I don't even listen to the rest. I, and I was talking to actually one of his folks, and I was like, yeah, that, that, that album. Well, there's no fillers on this you album. You can't do initials? Huh? Initials? No, I can't do that. <laughs> it was just, I just, I just did, so for me, I, 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 I got to feel it. Mm, I got yeah. to, right on. I didn't even realize, I, Aretha was a friend. She used to, we used to always text and talk. It wasn't until I was reading the book last night until Billy Preston was talking about her live album at the Fillmore. I'd never heard it. And then she's describing, they, in the book, they're talking about the song that Ray Charles did. Ray didn't want to perform. And Jerry Wexler went to him. He's like, no, I'm just here to listen. I don't, I don't want to perform. I don't want to sing. I'm just here. Mm -hmm. and then Aretha, doing the show, grabbed him. And he was like, I didn't even know her song. Mm -hmm. uh, he was like, so I just started playing whatever the hell I wanted to play. Yeah. He said, and it just came together. Yeah. And then they were like, no, we got to put that on the album. Nice. Mm -hmm. And I'm listening to it last night. I, I probably listened to that last night. I probably listened to that song 15 straight times. Mm. Wow. So again, a song, a song hits in a different way. I was yeah, on yeah. I was on Instagram one day, actually before the show, and I was talking about soul music. And I said the reason it's called soul music because it has to hit your soul, and I call it all shit music. <laughs> <laughs> no, like when a certain song comes on, you're like, oh yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. Every song don't do that. Well, yeah, you right. say that when you hear you, you it drink, oh well, shit. Well, when we were here it. last time, you said that about Right. About so that some song. songs you hear, you like, it. that's nice. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it ain't, it, right. no, it ain't and then, it, then it's the yeah. joints, oh, that's my joint. Yeah, yeah, for me, it's all oh, wow. shit. Yeah. It's gonna make you cuss. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's the, so a song has to hit, I mean, has to hit that way. Well, hopefully you have a couple, bunch of them that'll make you say that. Yeah. Oh, I'm on. And, and how will we yeah. know about? Oh, no, I'm gonna say it publicly. Right on. Oh, I post. I mean, I, I, I post music all the time. Cool. I remember John P. Key uh, and John, we praying for you. Yes. Uh, yes uh, please get well. He, uh, I was jamming one of his songs Saturday as I was packing. We moved to a new house in Virginia, mm -hmm. and I was listening to the song, and I sent him a text. He hit me back. Uh, I hadn't heard from him a couple of months, uh, but y'all, uh, John is getting better. Uh, yeah. He's keep praying for him, right on. Uh, and so just letting y'all know, he'll tell the story. Uh, but for all y'all folks who were lying about a heart attack and oh, he had complications from a weight loss surgery. All those are lies, but he'll tell y'all. Hey, mm -hmm. John P. Kid, kill you. Oh, that boy, that. <laughs> nah. You better not be putting nah, that yeah, out there. Nah, that nah, man, I, that ain't true. Nah, listen, nah. listen. I was jam so I was jamming. I was jamming one of John's songs, and I was on Instagram Live, and John hit me. He was like, "You, I think I, I listened uh, to that. I think I played the song like." I was just playing music on Instagram. I think I played it like 20 times in a row. Oh, wow. Uh, and there was a particular part in the song, and I kept hit. I had the DJ app. I kept going back to the beginning of it. Mm. And then I think I, it, I think I played it about 20 minutes straight, just that part, just that mm. hook. Mm. Uh, and John was like, dang, bro. I was like, say, bro, listen, that part was hitting right. Yeah. <laughs> I said, it was hitting right. So I, I will post on social. Folks will know. So, folks, Friday, uh, the album drops. Yeah. Uh, is pull a graphic up. This is the album color, cover right here. Uh, pull it up. Uh, the Music Forever Volume 1. What was uh, the creative behind the cover? Uh, the cover is a friend of mine, Ben Osborne. Uh, thanks for asking about that. Uh, local guy. Uh, he's a, uh, a great graphics designer. And uh, we internally did this album with shoestrings. I mean, we didn't have the funding to pull it off. We just all put our time and our love into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we kept bumping heads on what our covers, uh, prior covers were. And uh, uh, we reached out to him and he did it in one shot. Wow. One shot, he sent it back and it was done. And wow. It, it nailed it. It spoke to everybody. Yeah. Uh, everybody just had the utmost uh, comments about it. And I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy that he, he, he gifted it to us. Oh, okay. In a sense. That's I mean, awesome. It wasn't cheap, but it was, it was a gift. You know? I got you. <laughs> we've, we've been truly blessed through this whole journey. Yeah, it's yeah. been nothing but blessings. Nothing but blessings. Yeah. I mean, our, our, our relationship with you, like, 
st invaluable stuff has happened since we timing. all yeah. came together and decided we're gonna stick together. Yes. Um, I mean, a multitude of blessings, man. And, and right. once again, mm -hmm. thank you so much, bro. Appreciate oh, yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Glad thank to hear you so it. much. And tell, tell the graph, tell the graph designer, uh, definitely the great work because that uh, black and gold. I see been an alpha. Oh, yeah. I can see that. <laughs> black and gold. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And, 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 he's, and he's, local. he's local. I'm just saying. I can I can see it in the cover. So uh, that's, that, that's an excellent kit right there. So appreciate it. Drops Friday, folks. Uh, TMF. Uh, the as you see that volume one, the music forever, uh, available on all platforms. Y'all be sure to get it. Uh, that is it for us. Hope y'all enjoyed this listening session uh, and plus other stuff that we had. Don't forget, support us in what we do. Uh, what we do here, look, nobody else does. No other black-owned media platform does it. Not Black Enterprise, not Essence, not Blavity, not The Grio, uh, not, 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 not Ebony, uh, not any of these folks. And so our course, our show, two hours a day for Roger Muhammad, two hours a day, plus our weekly shows. And so what we're doing here at the Black Star Network is different than anybody else in black-owned media. Uh, and so this is why uh, having our own platform matters, as the nation's first black newspaper said right there in that quote, March 16, 1827, Freedom Journal. We, we, we wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us. Uh, and the reality is this here. When you own it, you can do what the hell you want to do. You don't have to ask permission. And so that's what it's all about. And so our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans uh, contributing on average 50 bucks each. We don't charge a subscription for the show. We want to make it available to everybody as widely possible. And so that's why we do that. So we're not on Patreon. We're not putting it behind a wall like a whole bunch of other podcasts. We want y'all to be able to access it. Uh, and so you can, so again, we want $20,000 fans giving on average 50 bucks each for all, $4.19 cents a month, 13 cents a day. Uh, five hours of original content every single day, plus all the live events that we broadcast. We broadcast the Black Women's Roundtable unveiling of their poll today. We're going to be covering their conference uh, the next three days on the Black Star Network app. Uh, so, senior check and money order, P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered, PayPal, or Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered, Zale, rolling at rollinsmartin.com, rolling at rollinmartinunfiltered.com. You can also, of course, uh, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Be sure to watch our 24-hour, seven-day week streaming channel. We're available on Amazon News by going to Amazon Fire. You can also tell Alexa play news from the Black Star Network. Also, Plex TV, Amazon Freebie, and Amazon Prime Video. And finally, be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Available at bookstores nationwide. Ben Bella Books, Indie Books, Target, Books A Million, Amazon. And be sure to get the audio version, which I read on Audible. Folks, that's it. I'll see y'all tomorrow. Phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?